to um, no one. Okay. Uh, I move to approve the minutes as presented. Okay. I second. All in favor? Okay. I, yes. It looks like Kurt's abstaining due to okay. his absence. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and the next thing on the agenda is public participation for items not identified for public hearing. And I'd like to also say that tonight um, we're having a study session, so normally there's not um, speaking points during the study session. So if you want to speak tonight, then um, do so, and you can sign up with Leah. Um, so the first person we have is Hans Price. Is Hans here? Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Hans Price. I'm a Boulder resident. I'm a great fan of open space, uh, both the uh, preservation and the recreation side. Um, I walk my dog on open space every day, and I'm the, an occasional mountain biker. Um, I um, uh, don't think um, I'm entitled to trail access. I think I need to earn uh, my trail access. That's why I've been volunteering um, whenever um, I had a chance. And um, this year, um, for the last for the last year, um, I have been volunteering um, through the Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance with OSMP. Um, been working with the Trails Group, um, and um, the reason why I am I wanted to address you today is um, on, back on September 30th, uh, the National Public Lands Day, we had a big uh, trail maintenance event um, where over 50 people helped us, um, uh, including uh, quite a few um, high school students. Uh, we rerouted about 1,500 feet of the High Plains Trail, which was very in very poor condition. Um, it was uh, eroded and, uh, and cupped, and um, together with the uh, trails crew, uh, we came up with a, a, a wonderful reroute um, yeah, that is uh, uses uh, uh, grade reversals and yeah, some some really advanced um, sustainable trail features. And I wanted to um, give some praise to um, the uh, Trails volunteer, volunteer Program Lead, um, Bo Clark, and his uh, supervisor, um, Chad Brotherton. Uh, we've, we've really worked uh, very well together um, on developing this reroute, and we're very happy um, with the way it turned out. Um, and yeah, we're hoping to uh, build on that in the near future over the next year. Um, there's plenty of other opportunities. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for making that happen and looking forward to, um, yeah, 2018. Thanks, Hans. The next one is Mike Barrow. And make sure you give us your address in your sure. city. Mike Barrow, 1103 Alexandria Street in Lafayette. Um, I'm also here to heap some praise. Double dose. Uh, and it's about the same stuff. Uh, I'm back from uh, a, a six-month hiatus away from uh, Colorado, and I was stunned when I was out on the High Plains Trail, and I rode the section of trail that was being reworked, and uh, 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 Jim Reeder would attest to me sending him pictures of this section of trail for at least six years, <laughs> saying, do something about this trail. And oh my gosh, you did something about it. And it was awesome. Great piece of work. It's fun and it's probably sustainable. Nobody ever knows if a trail's really gonna hold together until it's given the test of time. So you don't really know that. On top of that, uh, as I've, I've only been back a couple of weeks, 
I'm seeing changes uh, out on the South Boulder system, taking care of things that I consider awesome that I shouldn't consider anything but should be business as usual stuff, but it's still awesome. Uh, several pinch points where gates are on interior gates have been puddles forever. I'm telling you, more than a decade. And in the last couple of weeks, they're getting filled in and built back up. That's all it really, really needed. And it, it's great, and I'm happy to see these things starting to happen. Regular maintenance to improve the user experience. Everybody has to go through these pinch points. And they were the last pieces of the trail to dry out. So everybody all, you know, they, they were completely dry, and then they had to go through these puddles and either get muddy or get their bike dirty or whatever. And it's, and it's I'm just ecstatic to see the positive changes uh, that are going on on the trail now. And I, I pleaded with Jim, don't stop, and he assured me that they won't. So thank you, bye. Thanks, Mike. Sure, staff appreciates that. Um, Alan Delamere. No PowerPoint tonight. Alan Delamere, 525 Mapleton. Uh, I'll just give you a, uh, just a few points. Uh, I sent you an email on uh, the master plan, and I realized the title was a little bit uh, misleading. The 2018 master plan is not yet flawed. <laughs> it could become flawed, and I hope that we can, uh, we can correct it on the lines that I identified in my memo. Uh, dealing with the sensors uh, at uh, uh, Sanitas, uh, the, all the sensors have been removed now. Uh, but uh, some sensor data, which I was told this evening will be delivered to me tomorrow, that were taken f this summer. So I'll see what's actually there uh, in the next few days. Uh, open space parking. The developers have submitted the latest thing uh, this week. And needless to say, there is absolutely no provision for open space parking included in it. However, the good news, at least from my viewpoint, is that I took uh, Jane Brunigan and Jim Robertson uh, for a little tour looking at uh, Trailhead and some of the things that went wrong in the development of Trailhead. And in the course of that, um, we walked a, a little bit around and we looked at open space acquired and open space other. And Jane really shook us. She said, well, I've got no objection with condemnation, but the city council is very reluctant to do that. So all I say to you people, you know, there is chance that you could get that open space other uh, by condemnation if you can't do it with a win-win process. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And Alexia Parks. Hi, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Alexia Parks. I am, um, nine, my address is 973 Fifth Street in Boulder. And um, I'm a senior paneur, a senior entrepreneur, and, um, and a founder of something called Ten Traits Leadership, oh great, uh, Ten Traits uh, Leadership Institute. What I wanted to talk about today, and with thanks to um, Alan uh, Delamere for inviting me and suggesting I show up, is that there is an opportunity for um, these organizations, your open, uh, open space um, board and, and your management plan and, and the programs that you already have, to expand with another opportunity that we actually launched in 1977. I want to show a few slides from that. Back in 1977, uh, I received funding. I was the um, 
chair, the conservation chair of the Colorado Mountain Club Boulder chapter, and Alan Delmer was president or, or chairman at that time, and I received funding to go ahead and produce a book and um, study trails, and what this shows, what this shows is we actually had six trails along the front range that any child could reach by bus, by bicycle, by foot, <coughs> and they were able to um, explore them. But in this case, what we did, because I was a member of a club that had active uh, members, uh, we worked with the uh, open space rangers to identify the trails, the ones that could be easy enough for students to have in tennis shoes or dress shoes, easy access for all Boulder Valley. Uh, in fact, we engaged 24 at that time, 24 elementary schools, 12 participated with us the first semester the other 12, the second semester, we had 80 volunteers from the Colorado Mountain Club because what we did is we timed it uh, for two days a week. We had six trails and a six-week program, and first... 50% of those 12 schools would go on a Tuesday noon, so all of our volunteer adults gave them uh, like an extended two-hour lunch break, and the students came <coughs> by bus or whatever other vehicles, mainly by bus, and they arrived and were led and then gotten off the trails. And we developed, as you can see, we had trails that were listed. We had study problems. These were problems in today in a modern context because my close today is going to be talking about the idea of republishing this um, book, putting it up on your website, but in addition to that, relaunching the program because um, as you'll see, uh, we took, here's an example, Mount Sinitas Trail. Every single one had a, um, both a flora, fauna uh, highlight, so that trail that the students could understand and get into the science and the environmental uh, excitement of exploring. But they also had um, the problems like uh, fire control, water pollution, and, and mitigation issues that the students could study, uh, endangered wildlife, and what to do about that. So every single trail had one or multiple causes. I know you now have, um, you know, programs that are active out there for all the school children. I will submit that Boulder, and I am an entrepreneur, and I've run five businesses and launched two nonprofits over my career, so I'm kind of fitting the model of Boulder's female entrepreneurs, and we're like one, number one in the country, I think, according to Forbes, in terms of that. Um, so I want to promote the fact that Boulder could, with funding, and my bottom line here, I do have on the sheet I gave you, a funding source, and that's Greater Outdoor Colorado. Um, they take the lottery funds that come in every year, and for the last uh, I, I'm, I'm teen years, 40 years, maybe 50, they have taken funding uh, and actually used it statewide to purchase open space land. But they will agree uh, with, and I sure, I'm sure you will too, <coughs> that um, the biggest problem we have now is the fact that uh, research shows that 50% of today's students um, spend, uh, students today spend 50% less time outdoors than we did, than their parents did. And so when you think about buying this land and creating different programs, but then not really allowing or not uh, engaging them in as many ways as we can. I mean, we have good programs, but we need more and more. Because if we don't engage these students to actually go out and experience and get excited about being in open space, we may not have them uh, saving that and as a future legacy for their children and their future generations, they may just choose virtual reality. I mean, they grow up in cribs with a computer and a smartphone in their hand, you know, by age one or two, they're already operating it. So what is the incentive? This program that I ran, as I said, uh, it's, it was extremely popular. I had the templates. I have all the background. Um, I'll flip another slide or two here. Those are the goals that are shown in that booklet. Um, and so one of the asks that I'm going to say is, if you're interested, we can republish this book. You have, if you have funding, it doesn't cost that much, but we would ask for that if you were interested. But if if you would like even more funding, we would like to connect you in collaboration with us, in collaboration with the Colorado Mountain Club, perhaps Thorne Institute, uh, all the different other institutes and agencies that are actually putting people out in the field and create a program that's a bolder pilot project called Boulder Study pa Trails as a pilot project. It's brought up 40 years later now to the modern times, but everything there is still relevant. Everything there has not changed. 
to bring it back up, to actually create a program that has templates, and that could be used for all cities because part of the Greater uh, uh, Outdoors Colorado program wants to have all cities have that access to open space. We could model it, we could get the benefit for two years. I'm asking for two million, but not for me, but collaborative, and I, through my institute, I can actually give two credits to the EU of continuing ed for professionals and educators who decide to do it, and also two university credits for uh, university students who may want to take the role that we took as leaders of the Colorado Mountain Club to lead these students. So that's my ask tonight. I'm just gonna leave that with you because if you're interested, I'd be happy to come back at a later date and talk a little slower. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it, Lex. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to matters from the department. <clears throat> the first matter is the Chautauqua Access Management Plan. Uh, the the review of the 2017 pilot program. And uh, Colin Leslie is going to introduce our presenter. Uh, good evening, Colin Leslie, Human Dimensions Coordinator with Open Space Mountain Parks. So the, our short presentation tonight, and Bill Cowern, Principal Traffic Engineer from the city is gonna be giving that, but Darren Wagner and myself will be sitting in the background to help answer any follow-up questions that might come up um, that Bill can't answer. We also have Amanda Beavis and Susan Conley here tonight who are also on that working group team. Good evening, uh, trustees. Thank you for your time this evening. Uh, again, I'm here to give a brief very brief briefing on the um, Chautauqua Access Management Plan and the pilot uh, that we ran this past summer. Um, this uh, access plan um, pertains to the entire Chautauqua area, but it um, should be of interest to you because um, your, your area of um, influence in this is the ranger lot and the meadow and the trail system that, that leads away from there. Um, this is uh, the issues that surround access to Chautauqua have existed for um, many decades, but they, um, this current effort started in 2016 with our lease with the Colorado Chautauqua Association. Um, we went through an extensive process of data collection in the summer of 2016, um, a lot of public input in the development of a pilot program, um, which Kurt, thank you for participating in the uh, community working group. And then developed the pilot program, took that through the boards and the city council, and then implemented it this past summer. And so now we have some results to share with you. Um, we found that the program was very successful in accomplishing the goals that we had set out. Um, we were able to see um, really great transit ridership, over 900 riders per day um, on these uh, weekend days again. Um, we saw a reduction in parking um, on par with about 50 cars per hour through those days. And when you take that together, that's a lot more people arriving by transit, a lot fewer people arriving by car. We also saw a reduction in automobile and pedestrian conflict along Baseline Road. Um, so for these successful measurements and others, we've, we found the pilot to be very successful and are interested in moving forward with a very similar pilot in the summer of 2018. Um, I, in interest of time, I won't go through all these different potential changes that are in the memo that we provided, but these are some fairly modest changes um, that we're proposing to make to the pilot program. Otherwise, we would pr propose to run the pilot <coughs> program similar to the way that we ran it this past summer. Uh, again, that would involve charging for parking in the Ranger lot. And consequently, um, that would result in some changes to ordinances that would need to come back to the open space board and we'll be doing that um, in the first quarter of 2018. Our uh, preliminary recommendation is to extend the pilot for a period of five years. We think that um, at the conclusion of that time, 
your staff will have completed the update to the open space master plan. You will probably have completed uh, evaluation of the site specific plan in the Chautauqua area, and all of that information could help inform a final Chautauqua access management plan. Um, and I think that is it. Our staff is uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Who wants to start? Questions? Um, do we have any insight into how this is affecting sort of overall usage in Chautauqua, whether it's either making it, you know, net more attractive or net less attractive? I know it may be a little hard to get at that at that <clears throat> level of specificity, but do we have even anecdotal insight into that? So we did um, have trail counters in place in the Chautauqua Meadow to um, measure use and compare it to data that was actually collected in 2015. We saw we only had one month of actual overlap between those two collection periods, August. Um, there was actually a, a very slight reduction on the order of around 8% um, from what we saw in 2017 versus 2015 on uh, weekend days. Um, probably important to note in that is that because of all the trail maintenance going on in the Chautauqua area, it's hard to attribute that, um, that decrease to, to the camp program specifically, um, as well as just margin of error in the measurement of, of camps. But our preliminary um, use data doesn't show, certainly doesn't show a significant increase, um, and if anything, maybe a a moderate decrease. I, do we have any sort of anecdotal impressions from talking to people about um, whether it's making it more or less attractive for them to come to Chautauqua? So we did quite a bit of uh, public outreach through this as well. We did a community questionnaire. We talked with people who lived in the area. And generally, we found people to, be, to find this pilot pretty positive. Um, got a lot of people saying that, um, that it was easier to access the site and, and that that was a positive thing versus people who were saying they didn't want to pay and consequently they felt it was a negative thing. Um, the, the feedback was generally positive. That, you know, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, when, we, when we briefed boards on this previously, we, we didn't think that would be the case and we told people to go into this with your eyes wide open that this might be a very unpopular thing. And we were very surprised that's, that was not the case. Um, on a different <clears throat> subject, do we have any sort of information on which set of users is maybe disproportionately using the bus or on the flip side, disproportionately not using the shuttle bus system? You know, just from uh, some user groups are pretty, uh, particularly climbers, just by virtue of their packs and stuff, sometimes it's obvious what they're doing. But I don't know if we have some impressions about um, what groups are using the bus versus not. I don't think that we have any data that um, speaks to which user groups are using the, the shuttle versus who's still driving. Um, I, I think that we heard a lot of, there was a lot of people who used the shuttle who commented on the fact that this was their first time to Chautauqua or they were from out of town and um, this was a great opportunity for them to um, access without having to search for parking. Um, but I, I, mean, I don't think that that's, that's very anecdotal. Um, I'm highly confident that we had all user groups using the shuttle. Okay, that's good, because one of the concerns had been that <clears throat> for the first time and sort of one-time users might be disproportionately unlikely to use this just because it requires a certain yeah. amount of knowledge, and that's good to hear that that, in fact, wasn't the case, that people were figuring it out even on a first visit basis? I think, I think that what happened is that as they were approaching, well, they either saw it on our website because we marketed it pretty heavily, or um, as they were approaching on US 36, saw the VMS boards that we had and the signing that we had and, and were able to piece together, this is the place to get off and catch the shuttle. Okay. 
Just real quick, I know one of the things that's been a limitation this past year in terms of timing was that, you know, there's, what is it, the new Vista School, like we're, we're using parking lots for things that expire, you know, they need to use them come fall. And I was wondering if you had a sense of, does that time window work or do we need to think about finding places that, that next year that could go for a longer time period as in like did we see a drop-off before that lot was no longer available or do we have demand right up until the end and so therefore maybe we need to think about finding a different home for people to park so we used um, both the Novista parking lot and the Regent parking lot at CU uh, the the vast majority of people parked and took the shuttle from the Novista lot we found that to be an extremely important component of the program and consequently have already secured access to it from the school district for this coming summer. Um, we won't necessarily have that parking lot for all the weekends that we want to run the program. And so there may be some weekends where we don't have access to that and um, would be reliant on, say, the Regent lot or access from downtown. There was one weekend this past <coughs> summer where we didn't have access to New Vista and the ridership was down quite a bit um, and we'd expect that would probably be the case so access to that lot a long baseline that sort of ties to the signing and the the VMS that um, that captures you as you come in is um, pretty important and so we I think do want to explore a longer term more um, weeks out of the year arrangement with the school district and um, potential changes to that site that the school district and the University of Colorado are considering together might be an opportunity for us to to partner with them. Cool. Um, to, to build off of Tom's comment, uh, not user groups, but uh, socioeconomic groups, there have been concerns in the past that charging for um, drive up access to the park could adversely affect communities who can't afford that extra fee or um, or might uh, adversely affect uh, families with more gear going to meadow music for example so it's the um, was there any effort to collect data before and during the first year of camp about the socioeconomic status of the people who parked or used the shuttle yes. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. But the, um, I mean, I think our our thought would be that if someone was in a financial position to own a car and drive to the site, it shouldn't be a socioeconomic disadvantage to either drive up and park or to drive to the parking lot, park and take the shuttle for free. Okay. Other questions? Um, one of the concerns had been that, you know, by charging for, I think it's basically the first block, um, yeah. uh, the closest block, you would have the obvious effect of pushing people one block over. Um, what was the reaction of the neighbors who live, you know, kind of in the second block? So this is what the parking, this graphic here shows the parking utilization in the area where we did the neighborhood permit parking and then in the block surrounding it. And you can see, um, if you look first at the, um, the area in the blue zone, that's the NPP. You, that's the before condition, very high parking utilization during the average peak utilization period from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. afterwards that pretty much clears up. Parking in that area is um, much less impactful. If you go back, however, and look at Grant Place and 9th Street North and 10th Street to the east, you can see that those are yellow and green, and afterwards they're uh, pink and red. So clearly there was some parking that moved into those areas, um, and there has been some input from the people who live there that that was an undesirable <laughs> um, result, <laughs> um, and and we was are certainly allowing for the possibility that the neighborhood permit zone could expand um, if the people who live on that block are interested in doing that. 
the people who live on 10th Street, interestingly enough, that of the 91% parking utilization, have already contacted us and said they absolutely don't want to be in the NPP. They, will, they want us to promise them that we'll never ask again. So. Did they give you a reason why? They're like, I, we just like a lot of cars. I, they, I just don't think they believed our results. Um, they didn't perceive that it was a, an issue for them. I have a lot of guests. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's some pretty hefty parking utilization. And as I recall, that was proposed to be part of the uh, pilot was to cover. And they came back and said, no, leave us out. That's correct. Yeah. That's the, the zone that was originally proposed included that section and um, was taken out at their request. If you wonder where the libertarians in Boulder live. <laughs> So I took the shuttle a few times, but one time New Vista was closed, and I got there, and there were a bunch of families waiting, and there was no sign or anything. Shuttle bus guy came up and told us we needed to move the cars, and there was a lot of confusion. So my only comment about that would be that if that happens, you know, make sure we have good signage. and. Yep out there immediately because um, the people had been there for a while. And then, you know, it's very confusing where to go. And, then, and, you know, people were not real happy about it. But then I took it other times and it was fine. But yeah. I know New Vista has some restrictions. So. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Um, so the next step is that next month in December, the um, staff will come back with a recommendation or um, present to you a, a recommendation to extend the um, ordinance. It, it, it does sunset at the end of this year. Yep. And so um, next month you would receive an extension of that ordinance. Um, so just so you're fully informed and aware that that is the next step. Do and you want to... The other, the other boards will get their pieces that they'll make recommendations on. Oh, wait. We're actually... Oh, I'm sorry. January. Or February. Thank you, Colin. January. It's January, not December. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And do you want us to answer these questions for OSBD? We have three questions on the back. I didn't know if you wanted us to... Be formal in that response, or what are you looking so for? I'll, from I'll defer to Tracy because I know that you've got a well. You've robust asked agenda. You've, you've asked a lot of questions, so I think you did number one. Um, <laughs> that you gave some feedback that was helpful, and so and we're going to be returning in January. I should have read this question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not December, it's January. Uh, so uh, are you comfortable with uh, staff returning in January for the ordinance extension? Yeah. Sure. I am. I did have one item that I was going to just throw in. Right. Uh, I, I could go on for a long time about all the things I thought were great about this. <laughs> I do want to mention one thing that I thought was great, because I, I'm not sure I saw it in the description of the program going forward, and that was the, uh, what do we call them, the guides? Yes. Yeah. And I don't know whose idea that was, but to me, that Susan was... Susan Conley's, yeah. Is, would you like to stand up, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> I went two or three times and, you know, rode the shuttle and talked a, a lot with the people there and watched them talk to the guides. And for something that's new like this and a little <clears throat> bit challenging in the way it changes people's behavior and the way they work the system, I think it was absolutely essential to have those guides. I, the interaction they had with people, I just thought I would never want to do this again without those people. And so I would also make a quick shout out to whoever recruited and hired and trained those people that was a big deal. I mean, that's, well. well that would be okay. Susan Conley. That would be Susan <laughs> Conley. Really, they were fabulously wonderful people to have 
helping others in that. So anyway, I, I assume that's part of the program going forward. That's correct. Um, okay. Marianne Mahoney, who was also on the community working group with you um, and the, the Visitors Bureau, have, were great partners, um, both financially and in terms of management yeah. of this past pilot program. And they are um, extending that again into this coming summer. And they are going to take over um, the management of the the guides, Great. both on the tour buses or on, on the uh, shuttles and um, I guess making the shuttles tour buses <laughs> and um, and on the, the park itself. Yeah. Great. Great. You know, the only other thing I would say, uh, and I thought your recommendations covered all the public feedback that I saw. I know this is easy to ask for. It's probably hard to find, but if we could find electric trolleys, I, you know, the, the concerns about going up and down 9th Street and the noise and everything else, and of course it would feed on our whole city, you know, objective to go green. So yeah. would you find us a couple of those, please? Just, <laughs> okay. Just like that. <laughs> Thank you. <Yep. laughs> I have one little comment. Um, I can't believe Tom didn't catch this. Uh, um, Never catch typos, but I did catch this one. Um, on the meeting date of, on your memo from city council, it was a little confusing because the very last paragraph, it says on attachment B that it was approved on first reading April 4th, 2018. So that hadn't happened. So yeah. um, you might want to Clearly should have that. said 2017. Yeah, it was a little confusing. Yeah. So. Thanks for catching that. Anything else? We're good? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd just like to do a quick shout out for the multi-department cooperation and here. collaboration yeah. that's going on here. Yeah. And uh, here. the team's here. been here. fantastic. Yeah. Um, Christian Nunes is going to do a, provide a briefing on a mule deer study in collaboration with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Is Christian, or is Heather? Sorry. Heather Swanson. I get to do deer, Christian will be doing. Oh, right, Heather. sorry. God. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, I don't think that I've met quite everybody. So I'm Heather Swanson, um, one of the senior wildlife ecologists with the department. And I wanted to talk to you briefly about an exciting opportunity that we have um, in 2018 that staff is talking with the state about. Um, and it really has to do with our foothills ecosystems. So in our foothills ecosystems across our, our system, I'm not as smart as it is. Oh, did that do it? There it goes. So our, our main herbivores in these systems are large herbivores or mule deer. Um, we occasionally have white tailed deer, but predominantly in the foothills it's all mule deer. And then of course our large predator, which is the primary predator, especially for adult mule deer, are our mountain lions. And just a tiny bit of background, because I don't think any of you were on the board um, when we previously looked at some of this system. Um, Back in the 1980s, there were surveys done of deer populations um, sort of across the southern portion of the open space foothills. And then in 2005 to 2008, we did a collaborative study with what at the time was the Colorado Division of Wildlife, now it's Colorado Parks and Wildlife, looking at the deer and the mountain lions and especially chronic wasting disease in our deer. And then between 2008 and 2016, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife undertook a study of mountain lions in our foothills, um, which some of you have heard some about, and hopefully Matt Aldrich will be coming in to present some of those results um, in the near future. So back in 2005 to 2008, we were looking at what we called the Table Mesa deer herd. And so this is an area roughly from El Dorado Springs Drive up to Baseline, out to Broadway, and then sort of up to the um, flat irons and sort of the, the mountain peaks to the west. And during that time, we sampled um, about 117 mule deer, I think we caught, of those. Not all of them were ones that were actually enrolled in the study. But you can kind of see the study area and the aerial photo. So we're talking um, sort of Shanahan Ridge, Table Mesa area, and then to the west. And what we found was fairly striking at the time. Um, prevalence 
in our mule deer herd was extremely high, one of the highest that had been found anywhere. Uh, male infection rates was about 41% and females about 20%, so extremely high. We also saw a really large impact of chronic wasting disease of the survivorship expectation for any adult mule deer. So we found that CWD mortality added to the mortality factors that mule deer otherwise would face. But we also found, interestingly, maybe not surprisingly, that the mountain lions were very good at detecting the CWD-positive <coughs> deer and were most definitely selecting for those. Mm -hmm. So we also were looking at the deer population trends. So we did the, the same census that had been done back in the 1980s. And you can see on the left is the data from the 1980s. On the right are the four years that we did a census um, in that previous study. And you can see a pretty steep um, drop in that population between those time periods. So some other work at the time that was being done on chronic wasting disease had come up with some modeling looking at um, wild deer herds. So this was not based on our data. This was previous data to create these models, but it basically showed a prediction of what might happen with chronic wasting disease in wild mule deer, where you'd see um, initially very high um, infection rising steeply, and then there would be some sort of a plateau, and then a, a steep decrease initially in populations, and then some plateau, but at a lower level than the populations had been previously. So what our data allowed us to do at the time was to sort of fit our data to this model and see if it lined up um, with just a couple of data points in time. So this basically is our population data that I showed you, and then that little red bar is our prevalence that we measured at the time of this study. And if you fit those um, with the time period based on when CWD was first detected in Boulder, um, it seems to line up pretty well. But of course, it's only two points in time, and so um, there could be a whole lot more going on in there than we can see with this data. So in 2018 and 2019, what I'd like to talk to you about is an opportunity to revisit this data and to look at a lot of other really interesting and exciting questions. So there's been renewed interest at the state and federal level in chronic wasting disease again. Um, it sort of was, was not the um, dramatic problem that they initially had thought mule deer did not disappear. Yeah, it disappeared. <laughs> it just disappeared. <laughs> just disappeared. <laughs> but they've been seeing some trends that are a little bit worrisome, um, not just in Colorado, but in other areas of the country. So it's um, sort of come back onto the forefront for the state and federally. So the state doesn't want to work. Huh? Yeah, let me try. So anyway, the, the state is interested again, and the state has funding again to be looking at chronic wasting disease. So we've been talking with them about opportunities in Boulder um, to look again at that mule deer herd and collect essentially another point in time um, to do a population census to look. Okay, try your microphone again. Is this better? Oh, that's yeah. back on. Okay, at least that. Let's keep playing. Hold on. Can you see it, or it's gone even there? Um, I have it on mine, but. Hmm. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Is it possible that the B key got pushed? It's not there. Well, that's okay. I don't want to take up too much of your time. You have a lot of things to do tonight. So essentially, <laughs> um, we have the opportunity to really leverage a lot of opportunity from the state. So the state has um, funding and staffing and experience with capturing of wild mule deer that we really don't have on staff except for when we were previously involved in the study. So what we're looking at is really leveraging that as an opportunity not only to add to the overall understanding of chronic wasting disease, um, Boulder, as we often do, are, are our own unique 
situation, and there aren't a whole lot of mule deer herds that are not managed through hunting. So it's a somewhat unique situation to look at sort of the trajectory of populations and chronic wasting disease without the manipulation that hunting presents. So that's pretty interesting. It also gives us an opportunity to capture um, a relatively large number of mule deer. And what's happened since we did the study in 2005 through 2008 is the technology on GPS collars has come a long ways, and the cost of GPS collars has gone down dramatically. So it gives us the opportunity to use the opportunity to ca capture the deer to actually put collars on them so that we can track them, which then allows us to look at a lot of really interesting questions about habitat selection on open space. Are the deer responding to things like the tall oak grass invasion, which I know you've probably heard about on Shanahan Ridge? Um, What's the relationship, again, of mountain lions and their selection of, of which deer they're choosing to prey on with the backdrop of the additional information on the mountain lions on our system that we now have because of the state study? And it allows us to look at all kinds of other questions. Um, we've, got, we've had some prescribed burning. How are the deer responding to those conditions? How do they respond to trails? All types of things. So we're in the early stages of exploring this. Um, if we pursue it essentially first quarter um, after we've gone through our work planning and figured out what capacity we have as open space, we would work with the state to come up with a specific study plan, um, go through an MOU process with them to figure out exactly what that would look like, and then capture what happened in the fall. Usually we would, we would start about September um, to capture deer. September through December, a population census would be done, um, December and January, and then we could then track the deer through 2019 and maybe even beyond. The technology is startling to me as I'm looking into it, how long the batteries now last on those radio collars. So we might have a longer opportunity than I even knew. So um, we're exploring those options. I think it's an exciting chance for us, again, to um, continue our learning about these foothills ecosystems and a couple of the pretty key players in the wildlife community there. So. I think for now, I'll leave it at that. Questions? Comments? No. Sounds really cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. We look forward to hearing more. Yes, and we will definitely, as we've um, firmed things up and have more details about exactly what it'll look like, we'd be happy to come back and, and let you know about that. Be great. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now Christian Nunes is going to... <laughs> give an update on the um, 2017 relocation season. You want to sit right here? Why are these terribly bright lights on? I know. <laughs> we can ask. Yeah, we should put them down. Well, isn't there... Did, did someone see switch it? over there? Yeah, there's like a, a delegation. Yeah. On. Sorry. Here. Oh, yes. Yes. Close. No? No. Every light except this, the right one has been turned off. <laughs> These oh are gosh. just like lights. runway lights. I was okay until you said something, and now I can't. Sorry. Say it. <laughs> there we go. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Nunes. I'm a wildlife ecology technician for the city. Uh, Heather is my supervisor. Uh, I'm going to sit over here and look at my pictures of prairie dogs, which unfortunately you can't see. Uh, my update today is to just inform you about where we are with some of our relocation projects. Uh, this year we've undertaken three separate projects, two of which were from private property, pri private properties within the city, and then one of which is a continuing open space relocation. Last year, uh, the city council directed staff to uh, to receive prairie dogs from private property. Formerly, we just took prairie dogs from open space properties, but we want to avoid lethal control. Uh, we formed a prairie dog working group with community members this spring, and they continue to work to develop procedures and uh, basically ways that we can make relocations more effective. So we have two sites, uh, two sending sites, we call them, where we're capturing prairie dogs on private properties. One is Zero Diagonal Highway, 
which is as you leave Boulder on the diagonal, a small sliver of property there that will soon be developed. And the other is on Spine Road and Gun Barrel, which is a small property. We're also continuing to recapture animals at the Foothills Community Park near Wonderland Lake. Uh, that project has been ongoing for several years. It started in 2013, and animals, we have trapped and removed them and then moved them elsewhere, but every year we have populations that show up again, and so we continually go back to trap them. So let's see. We have two receiving sites. So we apply for permits to move prairie dogs with the state, and we have to pick select sites on our system that meet their strict requirements of the correct ecology, the correct grassland composition, uh, to make sure that these uh, relocations are successful. So we received two permits this year for two different receiving sites. One is called the Damianovich site, which is off Marshall Road, just east of Cherryvale Road. And the second is called the Wanaka property, and so that's off Highway 128 in the southern grasslands. We installed nest boxes, uh, which are buried about three or four feet deep in the ground. It's an artificial burrow structure for the animals. Uh, the number one priority is to give them some structure to, that we release them into because they're, they don't have a colony set up. The burrow structure isn't there quite yet, so that gives them kind of a head start and a protection from predators. So we installed 38 nest boxes on Damianovich this year and uh, we have existing nest boxes on Wanaka because it's been a site that's been used for many years. So currently, uh, we are nearing the completion of all three of these projects. The goal is to move the animals before the cold weather begins, and here we are. So uh, the Diagonal Crossing project, uh, they have relocated 185 animals, which is pretty close to the estimate of about 175 to 230. Uh, Spine Road, the other private property, they've relocated 25 animals, which was the estimate of the population there. And the Foothills Park, which is the city property, they've relocated 40 animals. Uh, the estimate there was about 35 to 45. Um, and the estimates are, because you do a count above ground, you can see who's out there that day, but you never know who's underground, so there's a little bit of flexibility there. And all the prairie dogs are doing well on the sites. They take to the nest boxes very well. Uh, the populations are doing well. The animals are, they get fed for several days after being released. Um, there are cages over the burrows to protect from coyotes and aerial predators like hawks. And those are being effective. And at this point, we're looking forward to completing these projects. Uh, if there are animals that are left on the sites, uh, and at this time, Foothills is still ongoing. There are still a couple animals there we're still trying to capture. Um, and then the private properties, they think that they've captured about 99% of the animals. But uh, Val Matheson, the urban wildlife coordinator for the city, is going to be looking at options. Uh, if there are still animals, then the developers do have options for lethal control if they want for those remaining animals, if they can't capture them. And the city has policies that outline when that's appropriate. And at the Foothills Park, we're going to continue to trap until we can get them all. And if we can't, we'll use a method called flushing, which is basically pouring soapy water down the burrow to help uh, convince the animal to leave. And then you capture them as they scurry out. Uh, but we have to do that before December 1st, because we're, that is kind of a, that's a deadline that the state gives us. Uh, and then in the future, this winter, we're gonna talk about ways to discourage recolonization of foothills, because this is about the third year since the main trapping effort that they've come back in numbers. So, um, and usually they're small numbers. Uh, this year, there were more because last year we didn't do any trapping and they had a breeding season. So the population doubled over the year. So, um, and we're gonna talk with Parks and Rec to, because it's a, a joint property there, a joint project. So we're talking about methods to really try to convince them not to come back. And we're awaiting outcomes from the Paradox Working Group. So those folks are gonna give us staff recommendations on how we can approach these projects in the future. And we continue to evaluate sites that we can use in 2018 and beyond. Um, hopefully Wanaka will continue to be a receiving site. And we are looking at 
other areas of the city where uh, relocations might be necessary. So we're always, uh, again, you know, if there are other developments that might happen, we are trying to get ahead of those and having enough space to receive those prairie dogs if those projects come about. And that is all I have. If you have any questions, I'd happily answer them. Okay. Um, I have a, a couple questions. So um, this may go back more than a year, but back when we were having the discussion about the armory site, one of the concerns was that if we received the prairie dogs from the armory site, it meant prairie dogs from Strady Klein and one other property whose name I don't remember um, would have to remain there, and that was going to have some adverse effects. I think it was more on agriculture, but um, on those properties. And I'm curious, and this may be more for Heather, who was, because you were the one who was making that point when we were discussing that issue, and hopefully I'm not totally butchering what the point was. I'm wondering what became of those prairie dogs, whether they're still there and, you know, kind of where they are in the queue. Yeah, they are still there. Um, and again, we will see sort of some of the recommendations to come out of the prairie dog working group. So I can't give any certainty on what things will look like going forward. What we're operating with now, though, is that top priority would be any prairie dogs within the city that are facing eminent lethal control, which would not apply to most open space sites. Um, and so that would include um, private properties, development properties. Um, it might include city properties that are slated for development, places like Valmont Park that may be coming online, um, and then it would be the open space priorities. So um, they do still remain there, and it is true that that, that shift in priorities um, puts them in a different place in the list. Um, a, a sort of a loosely related question, what was the sort of ultimate outcome of the relocation of the prairie dogs from the armory site? Do, do you know how many got moved and how many ultimately successfully relocated? You know how that turned out. Yeah. So uh, Heather, might be the the number is about 240 that were yeah. moved. Yeah, about 244. Yeah, about 244 animals removed there. Um, there's kind of an expected uh, decrease. You expect some sort of mortality rate with predation, um, and over the winter, animals just naturally die. Um, so the population is certainly persisting. Um, the acreage that is occupied has shrunk since last year. There's still animals living there. The population is still is, is going, um, but that num that original number is certainly shrunk. We don't have an accurate population number right now, but we just kind of look at the area. We go and walk the ground and see how many burrows there are that are active. Um, so it has retracted slightly, uh, but it's still operating as a prairie dog colony. Uh, soon after relocation last year at the armory site, uh, we had burrowing owls show up within a week. Um, it's, you know, there's a pack of five coyotes that live out there that are seen regularly. You know, it's a thriving, yeah. thriving prairie dog colony, and it's supporting the ecosystem that we would like. Um, and so, I would just add, it'll be interesting in the spring to see reproduction. Mm -hmm. With how late that relocation happened last fall, we would not have expected to see reproduction this spring. Um, but next spring, we'll then, I think, get a better sense of how well settled in they are and how well their social dynamics are establishing. Okay. And also, the diagonal crossing prairie dogs that we're moving this fall are directly adjacent to the armory animals. And so those two colonies, we separated them by about 100 yards of grassland. But since we've been putting all those animals from diagonal, they, the colony has expanded, and now they're all one colony. So um, we're adding more animals, and that will support that population. OK, thanks. Yeah. And just remind us when we expect the prairie dog working group recommendations to come. Um, Carrie is going to join us next month. Is that right? For an update on the prairie dog working group. Okay. And December. I, I know this is not our group. It's council's group. Yes. Are they going to present recommendations to us and ask for something? It, it's actually or? their recommendations to the city manager. Okay. Um, but but we'll certainly share that information with the board and get your input. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? I just had one sort of comment -y question, anything. Just wondering if we continue to prioritize private over public, which I, I actually see why that's a good idea. Is there some sort of like mitigation compensation that we can attach to that as well? Sort of like we're actually doing a service for private landowners 
they're saving money in some way or something and like pay us some money to help maintain our prairie dog habitat? Yeah, so um, with the armory development, there was um, a fairly substantial <coughs> chunk of money that was given to the city for exactly that reason, to kind of offset some of the costs. Um, with the current relocations, they are reimbursing us for some of our staff time. There isn't really a good regulatory framework, though, for there being a specific compensation or mit mitigation fee. Again, that may be something that, that the Prairie Dog Working Group discusses, so moving forward, that may very well change. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That's all we have from staff. So we're moving to matters from the board. Well, I want to personally say. <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> presents. Ooh. So. Everybody gets to. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh boy. Pass them down. <laughs> I don't need more than. Thank you. Molly, what about the food that was left over from last night? <laughs> <laughs> You're hungry after what we already ate? You got, you got the leftovers? Yeah. My... Gin and tonics to follow. <laughs> Are you going to do a one, two, three? Yeah, I, I think once we get everybody. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to find How often do we have audience thing. participation? You know, I was looking for a 50th anniversary <laughs> thing. Yeah, I was trying to explain this to this woman at a party store, and she was like, what? what is, this? is it a wedding? No. Is it a wedding? <laughs> okay, we're good? All right, countdown. Three, two, one. Okay, now we're done. Uh, back to being <laughs> professional. Yeah. Wah, wah, wah. So unprofessional. Uh, just couldn't resist. Um, so do we have a debrief for any? I, I thought it was great party. I mean, and I thought the Conservancy video was terrific and, you know, just so professionally done. and. Exciting to see the conservancy kick off, and you know, I just feel like we've got our next 50 years started, which is great. Other comments? Just or? kudos to all the staff that came and did so many different interesting uh, carnival barker things there. <laughs> it yeah. was really a lot of fun. Uh huh. It was fun. Great. And Jeff and Paige, the. Um, Music, yeah. uh, uh, bringing the young families in in the beginning was a real highlight. It, yeah. A lot of people were there for that. Mm -hmm. so awesome. It was very nice. Yeah. It was cute. Yeah. I had an issue for the board. Okay. Um, so on next month's uh, agenda is going to be the questions from council. Mm -hmm. And... Right. I think we ought to spend a minute deciding how we want to approach that so that um, we come prepared for, to do mm -hmm. whatever it is we decide we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the questions council's asking us really isn't a, an issue having to do with open space. It's, again, these sort of broader uh, sort of city priorities. And I think it's last year, candidly, we didn't really answer that question. We talked about open space. Um, <laughs> yeah, what we know. <laughs> so I think we ought to just have a quick discussion to, if we wish to speak to some broader city priorities. Um, we ought to discuss how exactly we want to, do we want to have people, you know, come prepared with some list or how do we want to accomplish that? Or if we want to, again, focus on open space, I think we will be more efficient next month 
if we decide, or at least begin the conversation now, well, what do we actually want to accomplish? Um, so they're not just at the risk of kind of looking at each other next month about, okay, now what? Yeah, what, so, all right. and, and we also we also have on January 10th that you would could finalize mm -hmm. the input to the council for their retreat. December is an opportunity to discuss, and of course you're welcome today since you already know what the council questions are. Mm -hmm. uh, how has this board handled this duty in the past? I think. Well, so, well go ahead. Uh, Tom. I was saying we handled it different ways. Um, I mean, the question of whether we were going to get into issues outside of the, our purview, I think we just decided, no, we were going to focus on open space questions. One, two years ago, I may get this wrong, but I think two years ago, we each so it was sort of listed some things, and then Leah compiled them um, for us, and then we sort of uh, whittled the list down a little bit, but it ended up producing a somewhat disjointed, in my opinion, somewhat disjointed sort of hodgepodge of different things, which, you know, were interesting ideas, but there wasn't, there wasn't much um, sort of uh, holisticness to it. Um, last year, as I recall, the two of you um, wrote a, was that right? And it's sort of more of a, you know, more of an essay of some ideas of how we might go about that. And then um, we, you know, did some work on that. We, we sort of discussed like bef during a meeting, kind of what we were going to write. Mm -hmm. Then we went off and, because just to have the two of us working so we're not having a daylight problem, and brought it back and said, you all okay with this? Because mm -hmm. we snuck in all the secret text that was like, and then you'll pay Kurt and Kevin millions mm -hmm. of dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. No one caught that. Thank you very much. <laughs> just kidding. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um. It seems to me this year is a little different, maybe, because of the master plan, because we're going to ask the council in some way, and maybe Tracy can remind us, to bless lists of issues or something like that at the beginning of the process. And I mean, so I, th I think we would take advantage of the opportunity to tell council that, to remind them of, of that, and you know, lay it out in a question to council in some fashion. Can you connect dots for me? Well, sure. And Sorry. Um, if we think about the timing, council, so there is this council board process subcommittee that's looking at the, the overall process and the timing of it and when different milestones would occur. And you're having a study session about that uh, here in just a little bit. You'll take action on it at the December meeting. <clears throat> there will also be a briefing on the master plan process specifically at the January 4th City Council meeting. And then they're expected to take action endorsing the process at the January 16th Council meeting. That all um, comes before the council retreat, which is not until the 20th or so. So they'll actually have quite a bit of background on the master plan uh, in advance of the retreat. So for example, if we want council to revisit the list of overarching issues, that magical list that has sort of a life of its own, I think that might be a good thing to sort of remind them of because I think the timing fits the way Tracy's described it. So mm -hmm. that's my only thought. My input would be I think we have enough to <coughs> discuss if we just keep our focus still on, on open space. Uh, I mean, obviously, I have my own opinions about all kinds of things about the city, but like we could we could spend weeks crafting all of our list of wish list of city things. That's not. <laughs> well, and we can do it independently. Also, that was a a request. We could send in our comments independently as well if you had other city related things so well i felt like it worked pretty well yeah. last year when we compiled things um so do we want to i mean appoint a two-person committee is that the 
Would that be the same? I, I think we might wait and see what we come up with next time in terms of focal questions or something like that and see if it's so complicated we need somebody to distill it. Okay. So the uh, proposal is that we will come prepared in December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Come with, come with your witness. <coughs> yeah. You know, and okay. I, I'm always trying to imagine what happens when council gets this input because they get it from every board. And so I think it's a tsunami of stuff, and that to me suggests that we should try to pick the one thing <laughs> and get them focused on it. Yes, I think, I think there's oh, so much. Yeah, I think also if we put like a bunch of chocolate bars in with ours, <laughs> they might get to ours first. I think there there is value in brevity, and there's value in sticking to what you know sort of has an impact on what council has before them. Um, you know. Um, Stick to what you know. They're going to really, I think, care about. I think we have enough stuff that that will would make for a meaningful submission. I think so. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. okay. So we just bring our list. Next meeting. All right. Any other matters from the board? Um. Well, I have two. One really briefly, I think Alexia is, has left. Yeah, um, but maybe someone who knows her or someone out in TV land could just mention. Um, I looked up and I know that Boulder County uh, has a trails app that includes stuff in city of Boulder and they're in the process of revamping it. Mm -hmm. And that might actually be a really great opportunity for her to talk to Boulder County about this because adding in things like history and things about the area could be something that go, could go into the revamp of this app. Mm -hmm. So Alexia out there, wherever you are. Um, and then the second one was, I just wanted to say that um, I had a talk earlier tonight with staff about the Cobalt Trail um, opening up, which we had talked about last month. And so I think that's why um, they're, they're not presenting on anything tonight. Um, and, and briefly, um, the, I think there was a misunderstanding about what I thought the cause of the problem was that, that people were going too fast on the Eagle Trail. And I restated that I think the problem is actually that it's just too dangerous at any speed. And in fact, it's a problem where you have a lot of beginning um, trail users um, in that area and the Eagle Trail descent is a not beginning um, trail. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to look into um, potentially rerouting the Eagle Trail sooner rather than later, or opening the Cobalt Trail sooner rather than later, and uh, you're going to try and report back to me and or us um, sometime in the next couple of months, I guess. So hopefully we'll have some input on that then. Um, okay. So that was my other thing. Do, have we ever tried to address some of that with signage? So the problem with signage is, is that it's not an issue of too much speed. It's not, it's not people going too fast. It's literally you have a very beginner trail that, that anyone could use as a hiker or, or a, a bicyclist. Can, and then 100 yards of, like, basically a black diamond trail. In the middle. In the middle that's connecting two large areas. And so the one really good friend of mine who crashed was, like, learning to ride a mountain bike and went to go down this and tried to stop and get off and crashed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, and not going fast in the first place. So it was like, I'm feeling scared. I think I'll stop and get off. And then next thing, you know, you know, eating the ground. So um, I think signage probably won't make a huge difference. It's more of a question of, it's scheduled to be rerouted anyways. Yeah. And the Cobalt Trail is scheduled to be opened to multi-use as part of its, um, the North TSA plan as well. Um, and there's some discussion about how that's going to be rerouted. But the Cobalt Trail as it is now, the reason why I suggested it is because instead of having, say, a 12 to 15 percent pitch, which is what the Eagle Trail has, has like a 3 percent pitch. So um, the possibility of getting speeds um, at that for a beginner would be much lower. Yeah. So anyway, w hopefully the, the, the word was that we'll hear back soon. <clears throat> That was my thing. Uh, I wanted to raise that we've had a we had a number of emails over the last month about a property that the emails were referring to as 8600 baseline, which apparently is a, a development um, 
that's it's past being proposed, right? Well, anyways, the community members contacted us because there was a hope that we would try and pursue this as an open space purchase. Um, and I just wanted to bring it up and see if, if has staff responded to any of these um, community members? Let's see. I, um, I don't see Dan Burke here, but I did check in with the real estate folks. Oh, Dan is here. Dan is here, okay. And, and Dan, maybe I'll give a quick little synopsis that uh, the real estate folks did look into it. Uh, we don't have property that is directly adjacent. Um, Lafayette, Louisville, and Boulder County do. Okay. And it's also in Lafayette's urban growth boundary. Mm -hmm. So we feel like it is not ours to okay. pursue. <coughs> All right. Did I get that accurately? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. So are we ready to take a little break and then go to the study session. Mm -hmm. All right. Do, do we have to adjourn our official meeting to do that? Uh, do we? Hit? I guess we do. Yes, do. Okay, it's all done. <laughs> there you go.
to start working with the board on the upcoming uh, open space and mountain parks master plan. Tonight is a work session and um, it's an opportunity for us to really discuss and, and work through uh, what we're focusing on tonight, which is the um, process. And as uh, we mentioned earlier in the evening, um, the idea is that we'll really work through the process. Uh, we'll have a report out uh, from the subcommittee, uh, from the process um, committee that met earlier today, I imagine. Um, but really, this is an opportunity for the full, full board to focus on the, the process for the plan. Uh, and we anticipate coming back to the December meeting and looking forward to a recommendation from the board uh, to the city council on the process. And as I already mentioned, the January 4th and January 16th timing on the council agendas. Um, we also will have um, an outline for the system overview report uh, that we'll be talking about, but really the majority of this evening's session is about the master plan process. And with that, I'll pass it to Darren. So oh, just a quick reminder, um, the microphones, uh, the push button, you see the red ring, green ring, um, and the, tele the television does pick up the audio when the green ring is on. So essentially, if, when you're not talking, if you guys wouldn't mind turning them off until you're ready to talk, that'd be super. Terrific. Okay, thank you, Tracy, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, we are at an exciting time, and it, it is a chance, I think, that a lot of us have been waiting for to have a really good meeting discussion. Things are starting to come into focus as it relates to our master plan, and I think we're at an exciting time that we just celebrated last night, uh, the celebration of our 50th, and I don't know who still has the stamp on their wrist, but I certainly <laughs> do, okay, good. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, we, uh, we did have a lot of fun, we were up moving a lot last night tonight you know it was a little more sedentary but you do see toys in front of you so please if you need a distraction of some kind let's use these as last resorts but if we're really getting off the rails then perhaps we might need these um, so I do just want to give an overview of the agenda and mention that the one that was attached in the memo is a, just a slight we're going to change the order just a little bit tonight still go over the same information and that's because, as Tracy mentioned, we do want to focus on the process and we have a lot to talk about. And so, whereas we had proposed in the agenda that we would go over the process overview, take a little bit of a hiatus to talk about the report, and then come back to public engagement, we're going to try and do all of the process and engagement together and then save the report for the last about 20% of our discussion. So, does that sound okay with everybody? Okay. Um, and what I want to do in this first session um, about process overview is invite Kurt and Tom in particular to share or refine any of the things that I present. Um, and we'll take a pause at the end of just the very, the very overview of the planning process, have a brief discussion, then I'll go through the next part, which is to really go into the engagement strategy a little bit more in depth. Uh, then again, we'll take a pause and have a pretty good discussion, and then we'll talk about the report. So you also have um, the, in a copy of the project management plan in front of you. It was also included in the packet for the public to see. Um, and we're going to review how, the status of that because, as Tracy mentioned, a version of that is what we're going to ask you to endorse next month, that you recommend that council adopts a version of that. And really tonight and and the purpose of even that project management plan itself is to build a shared understanding of what the process is going to look like this is the first time we've ever done a master plan i think there are a lot of questions about what that might look like we're trying to build in as much clarity in advance as we can and so that's the goal of of, of the study session tonight and again that that uh, project management plan itself so again just a revision uh, of the agenda focusing on process uh, and engagement and then getting to the overview so if you look, I'm going to refer a couple of times back and forth to the project management plan just to make sure we're all familiar with it. So on page one, we talk about why we need an open space master plan. And really, again, we this year marks 50 years since that the passage of the nation's first municipal tax to fund open space. 
today, where we are today, we own 45, more than 45,000 acres of public land. And what does that mean? What is the vision now for those next 50 years? We steward a lot of, of treasured resources for the community. And so how do we build a vision that, that anticipates the next 50 years? It's a great, it's a great time to, to pause and think about that. The other slightly more practical way of describing the purpose of the plan is that we do have, OSMP has a number of resource and area plans in place, but we have never had a system-wide plan for open space and master par uh, mountain parks that pulls those plans together. And so what this master plan is intended to do is to, the process itself is intended to be an inclusive community-based effort that produces an integrated strategic approach to OSMP, ma uh, OSMP management for the next decade and beyond, trying to anticipate the next 50 years as we, as we can see it now. So how are we gonna do that? There are gonna be a lot of inputs, obviously, and some of the major ones as we think to sort of the, the next big milestone in the process is the development of what we're calling focus areas. Those are our, our management themes, the things that are gonna guide OSMP management at a strategic level. How are, we, how are we gonna develop those focus areas? There, again, the inputs really on the left are the, the things that we always start with are the OSMP purposes in the city charter. That is where we always begin our discussions. We also wanna have a values-based discussion with the community. There are a number of values already inherent in the city charter and what do those mean to us today and how do we interpret um, the ways we'll manage according to those charter purposes into the future? Those are sort of our basic building blocks, if you can think of that. And, and it's an opportunity both to provide some education around what those charter purposes are and what they mean, and have engagement around those values. And based on that, we can then start to think about what, what does that mean? How does that tear us into the future? So, so what are our current and future conditions? And based on those, what are those strategic opportunities? And, and Kurt, you'll notice that we try to get in some of your suggestion there. I hope you recognize those words. Um, and, and let those things define the focus areas. And our goal is really, if you look, I, I, oh, not there, here, um, a graphic that's also in the project management plan. We'll talk about this in a little bit more depth. But really, by the middle of next year, we're hoping to come to agreement about what our focus areas are. And so that'll be the time where we agree as a community, as the board, as council, what those, what those strategic management themes should be for us. I always like to start with the end in mind, and so if you advance to the end of this process and think about how we're gonna make those final decisions, we wanted to be clear about what that process might look like. That's a recommendation that's come forward out of the Public Participation Working Group, which was a citywide working group set up to understand and make recommendations to improve public process, and one of the things they said is make sure that the public understands how decisions get made. And so again, we're saying this a number of ways, but just wanna make sure this is clear that again, there are lots of inputs to decision making. And so of course, we always start with the city charter. There are also other sideboards, other laws, policies, and plans that come into play. Community values, ideas, and feedback are also central to how we'll operate through this process. We'll use best available data and, and research. And, and I'll talk about sort of what that, what that looks like in a little bit more depth here in a second. Staff and consultant expertise are an important contribution to how we'll come to recommendations and eventual decisions. Um, and I do, um, also, sorry, Danica, <laughs> I wanted to introduce Danica Powell here. She's our, one of our sub-consultants on the team and she's really supporting us around the idea and, and process of engagement. She's a sub to Design Workshop, who's our, our prime on the project. Their project manager uh, wasn't able to be here tonight, but we're lucky to have Danica here um, to help us frame and, and work through the engagement process going forward too. Um, and available funding and staff resources, that's another really important contribution to the development of recommendations down the road. And we'll be doing some um, you know, financial scenarios to understand how we can really ground truth our recommendations in financial reality and what that looks like. And so if you think about all those inputs coming together into the form of recommendations that staff bring forward in the form of a draft plan, we'll then take that to the full board and ask for your recommendation to uh, city council and that you're familiar with. The slight difference is that with the master plan, we are required to also go to the planning board. And what that means is that's the planning board's opportunity to 
endorse the relationship between our master plan and the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, make sure those two things are in alignment, as well as the citywide uh, capital improvements plan, and make sure that our recommendations are, are aligning with that as well. So the planning board will also recommend the master plan to city council, and then city council, as, as is typical, will endorse that final plan. Don't forget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, have we had conversations with the planning board about what makes the world's greatest master plan and the 10 things to avoid in a master plan? I mean, is there anything useful they can tell us now? We have not had that conversation directly with planning board. However, we are, uh, as a planning group, often engaged with a citywide master planning committee. Uh -huh. And that's a group of staff that meets regularly to talk about that sort of thing. And so we are working with them to understand and anticipate those. Great. So they have the answers. All of the answers. They've got it all figured out. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a great question. So you saw an asterisk there back on the last diagram about best, avail best available data and research. And, and this is a point that we want to make sure is clear and that you all understand and support. What, why that's there is because we'll end up in the final plan we envision having a mix of different kinds of strategies as we think about sort of the major buckets we might put them in. <laughs> and so that might look like a, a bucket of strategies or planning and design strategies that recommend additional plans or follow-up design efforts that we uh, need to get to work on after the master plan is complete. Uh, that might include some, some new either updates to existing plans in order to bring them into alignment from a uh, system-wide perspective, or it might be the creation of new plans or designs. The other general bucket would be kind of general management and operations, so the kinds of strategies that guide are the future pro uh, programs and projects that will help us implement that master plan. The caveat is that we are going to, we envision, have some strategies that may also call for the collection or analysis of additional data. And we recognize that there, while we have quite a bit of data available to us, we, we can't know it all. And we have to develop some strategies and develop some comfort around um, knowing when, the, uh, when a strategy needs additional analysis or testing or research and development or what, what piloting, you know, and we might recognize that there are some strategies we can sort of go further with if we have been working with them longer or know more about them. And there might be others where we have to learn how to crawl before we walk and then run. So again, starting with the end end in mind is that after council approves that final master plan, that's when we envision doing a, a separate follow-on uh, effort to develop an implementation plan. And that really guides and lands the plane, so to speak, in terms of the broad strategies we develop in the master plan and builds that out across the short, mid, and long term in terms of the actual actions, programs, and projects that we would go to work on to implement the master plan. And so again, we wanted to make sure that that was clear too, that the master plan itself is operating at a strategic policy level, and the detailed actions come after the adoption of that master plan. If we had anything like this in open space that we could point to and say, well, this is an example of an implementation plan. I mean, this is more than a one-year work plan, right? But it's less than a master plan. I'm just curious if we, if, if somebody in the public asks, well, what do you mean? Uh, what, would, what would we show them? I think in most cases, uh, our implementation plans uh, were, were sometimes brought out um, uh, in TSA plans a little bit more directly because they were of a finer scale. But um, in our resource plans and, and in the VMP, again, we were dealing with a pretty general level. And so they, they kind of were folded into annual work planning. And so this, this I think, will be some, some new ground for us to cut. But there are, this is a good example from the transportation master plan. And there are certainly other city master plans that have had that kind of work done. Yeah, and this is, I mean, a great example from the transportation master plan, just to sort of give an idea of what ours might look like. It's not, uh, you know, we're obviously a long way from this, but that, you know, if you look at that top category of transportation demand management, that is a focus area of the transportation master plan. The, this strategy there, increase access to eco path, uh, 
Yep, increase access to EcoPass. That's a strategy level um, recommendation that was in the master plan. So it's the details beneath that would come afterwards, if that helps make sense. Any questions about that, Andrea? I'm, look, I'm seeing your wheels turn. Is it, maybe it's I the have, water. I have no questions. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I wanna just, oh sure, yeah. I, I had a question about tonight, actually. What's the best way for us to interact? Like, should we just pop off questions all the time, or do you want to work through and then we should ask questions after? What, what works best for you and the team? Sure, yeah, so as I mentioned, so this first part, I envisioned it to be like this, popping back and forth, especially with highlights from Tom and Kurt to help elucidate anything I might miss. Uh, then we'll take a pause, let's have a, a more in-depth conversation about it. Then the next section, I do want to try and get through because I, 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 I hopefully will anticipate some of your questions and then we'll have a good discussion afterwards. So, we, so we're doing it in sort of three parts. Does that work? Okay. Yep. Then if I could go back one slide. Okay. I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Um, so to kind of build off of what you, what you said with this slide, something that I, I had taken away from past discussions was that in some aspects the master plan will end up being a framework for work we'll do in the future because when we don't have data available or we need to do more research or, or you know, need more analysis or whatever, but we're setting up a, a bucket, if you will, for, okay, this is something that we want to work on over the next two years, five years, 10 years, whatever it is. And we don't have to feel obligated under the master plan to answer all the questions today. And I just kind of wanted to say that in another way for the community because that was a major take home for me. Yeah, yeah, that was really well put. I appreciate okay. that. Yep, yep, okay. So I wanna just go back to the project management plan and just continue to walk us through that. Um, so we talked about the purpose of the master plan and really the rest of that first page is trying to describe in, in a little bit more depth what we're ho hoping to achieve and, and why we're hoping the community gets engaged. This is, this is a community-based effort and we want through this process to build alignment around the ways that we as staff and the community agree on our shared goals for the next 10 years and so we really do mean this very in, in, uh, with a lot of integrity that we need community invo involvement. Um, the next page on page three of the project management plan also want to make clear that what we are not going to do in this process is make recommendations to change the city charter. That is where we start and that is sacrosanct so to speak and it's not something again that we'll revisit. So I wanted to make that clear. The next page is the, the diagram. The, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I, I would like to speak to page two and three if that's okay. all right. Um, I think it was step one of the, the public process working group is you have to define what, what you're going to achieve, right? And I think that it's under the what do we hope to achieve, although it's not, wouldn't be like an especially sexy bullet point, I think a major one is that this becomes a, a work plan for staff. Um, and, and we kind of dance around it by talking about prioritizing and things like that. But like, in a sense, we're, we're setting up in a fiscally constrained environment, you know, where are we gonna go? What is our top priority as a community? And I, I feel like that is not is insufficiently emphasized here, at least for me. That's excellent. I, I appreciate that, I really do. I also, it's dawning on me, I wanted to remind everybody that Leah is taking notes for us too, so just in case anybody's wondering, um, that's what she's, <laughs> she's behind the flip chart over there, so thank you as always, Leah. <laughs> Um, hey, Darren, sure. I did want to point out that the sixth bullet under what do we hope to achieve does address work planning and budget. Mm -hmm. um, so it is in there, but maybe we could say it more explicitly. I guess I felt like it was so important it needed to be bolded out and, and you know, had a color with it. Thank you. Yes. And I appreciate that because some of these, some aspects of the process will be nice and sexy and exciting and then others are realistic and we need that guidance. And so thanks for reminding us and kind of keeping us grounded. Yep. Okay, so for the moment, I'm gonna skip over this diagram because we're gonna come back to it. 
um, on page five, what the master plan will and won't include, um, the idea here is that it's going to include a lot. And it's our first time doing it, um, to Andrea's point. Um, but it's going to give us that integration of where we are today and where we want to move into the future at a strategic level. Um, we hope to also develop some broad metrics that help convey our success towards the agreements that we make as a community and this staff. And so that's uh, an important piece also. Um, and we'll have those strategic priorities coming out of it that, you know, become our sort of playbook and our way to communicate with ourselves and with the public about what we're, what we're focusing on, what we're going to work on. Um, we are, you know, going to talk about um, the, the life cycle of these strategies and, and come up with, again, a very realistic picture of what we think we can achieve based on what we expect to be financial realities. And, and that is, again, another one of those very important things that grounds this, this plan. Um, I talked about the, the next part of this, which is that what comes after the master plan, that's where we start to build in an implementation plan that gives us a little bit more detail. Um, that's where we have coming out of the master plan that enhanced approach, you know, to planning, to acquisition, to, um, to making those updates to existing plans. Um, and what we're, but again, what we're not including is not only are we, we're not going to make recommendations to change the charter, but we're also not going down to any level of detail akin to what we've done in the past. So it's not, it's going to feel different than a North TSA or any other kind of resource plan that we've done. Um, we are not going to be talking about site specific decisions uh, as it relates to regulated activities or um, you know, the exact alignment of trails. We're really operating again at a strategic level. Um, on page six, <coughs> we are trying to ground our public involvement strategy here and do it in a way that's accessible so that any member of the public could look at this and, and understand what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I am going to go into this in a little bit more depth in the, in the next part of the session, and so I want to save a lot of discussion for this later, except to say here that we are working with citywide staff to incorporate the recommendations of the Public Participation Working Group, uh, PPWG, um, and so those are recommendations that were made to city staff. And city staff is in the process of firming those up as a citywide approach to engagement, and they'll take that then to council in uh, later this month uh, for approval of what that looks like. So we're in close coordination with them. The diagram on page seven outlines how we would align with the recommendations that came out of PPWG, their nine-step process to engagement. And so that's what this diagram is meant to be. Those outside boxes are how we would sort of uh, go about achieving their recommendations. Um, but just keep in mind, these the, the wording on these or the exact approach might change, and we'll stay in coordination with, with the rest of the city on that. All right, so I'm also going to save a lot of discussion on the next page about what makes this process successful for the, the conversation on uh, community engagement, which we'll have in a little bit. Um, but I also want to point out that the high-level sections here, defining a clear purpose, planning for thoughtful, respectful engagement, inviting all voices to the table, and implementing a trustworthy, transparent process, those are principles that are largely drawn also from the PPWG. And so we're really trying to build in alignment and pilot those recommendations that, that came from that group. And we already talked about page nine. So that's the brief overview of the project management plan. And again, to reiterate, what we want to talk about tonight is any changes or refinements that you might have, not only to the way we've described this, but any process refinements that you want to make so that what you see in December, you're comfortable with, that you can very easily recommend that next step to city council. Do you want to, or are you planning to just sort of tie those things to the schedule. Uh, I can do that now. I, I think it would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to have to stand up for this. I, do I, take do I just take it? Okay. <laughs> this is so exciting. <laughs> I feel like, ooh. We do have a, a, a regular microphone. That's, 
I got it. It's not too heavy. Not too heavy. Thank you. All right. So we're going to use this as a, a place to also capture, capture some notes tonight about any refinements that you might have. And one of the questions that we'll explore in a little bit is also how the board wants to be involved. And so if there are key milestones at which you know you might want to study a session or to be involved in any other way, I want to mark those down too so we can start to, to um, anticipate those. But just to explain the diagram. For those who might be new to it, we're seeing this as a general timeline. This may shift. It's a draft. Um, but our intention is to try and wrap up this process by uh, the um, uh, third quarter of 2019. And so where we would start, we've been working this year to develop, start developing this process to work with the process committee and try and refine those recommendations. We've been drafting the system overview report, which we'll also talk about tonight. So that's what's sort of under here in project planning. We hope, given uh, acceptance from both the full board and council, that we would kick off the public process in February, towards the, the latter half of February, and that we would have a first phase talking about that, um, starting with that conversation of uh, current conditions that's in the system overview and having a broad-based discussion about community values. Again, I'm going to go into that a little bit more here in a bit. Um, We've also built in, you'll see in the diagram, this idea of engagement windows. And so these are the idea, this is the idea that we will sort of open the door, so to speak, and say, we'd like to work with you, public, to understand your ideas, your feedback, your concerns. We will then have to close that door because we as staff have to analyze the comments and build those into the next round of, of, uh, of deliverables and recommendations. And so we do, we, we do have to be clear about that for both ourselves and with the board and as uh, members of the community engage. And so these, as they're drawn here, just so you know, are draft. We haven't actually scheduled the dates yet because we can't do that until we have uh, council's approval of the process. So the concept is just to illustrate that we'll have these engagement windows and that we'll be clear about what they, what they are when we actually get there. So the next major phase would be um, working through this idea of future trends. How do we build in ideas of what the future is going to look like into the development of those focus areas, which, which I talked about before. And that would be an opportunity really, again, in the middle of next year to work with full board and council to confirm what those focus areas are so that we really have confirmation of that so that we can start developing strategies that attach to each of those focus areas and not have to go back. If we really are trying to get this plan done um, you know, in a reasonable amount of time, which is roughly about 18 months, then we have to agree on some efficiencies in the process. And that's one of our hopes is that we can do that in the middle of next year is confirm those focus areas. So then we would, from there, develop those strategies and, and from there, then priorities with the community. And what that means is that um, about by the end of next year, that's when the largest part of community engagement starts to wind down because we start to then have to build in the development of a draft plan and we bring that to the board for review. We bring that um, and then we bring back a revision and that we hope then by um, the time we take it to council that we've built enough alignment that the nature and level of engagement has, um, it, it's, it's, it's more focused um, and that we've built enough alignment that that's when um, we're just confirming the agreements that we've made through the course of next year. And then again, after that approval by council, that's when we start implementation planning so that hopefully in 2020 we can get to work on subsequent efforts. Does that help? Could you clarify what the deliverables are, at, if any, at the end of each of those, particularly the first three uh, boxes? In other words, like the, uh, I'll take future trends and focus areas as an example. Is the vision that what would come out of that is a deliverable that it may not literally be the draft of that section of the plan, but it's in substance, that's what comes out of that? Because then there's obviously a board question about, you know, how, how do we get from what staff drafts to what is essentially the first draft of that section of the plan? 
Mm -hmm. So, so I will admit we because we need to build alignment with both board and council. The details of exactly what what every d deliverable will be have not been worked out yet, and that's in part to be um, flexible and responsive to what we hear from both of you. But generally, as we think about this particular one, since I heard you ask that first, that w our hope is that if we hold a joint study session with both board and council, that we have confirmation by the end of that study session on our focus areas. So that would be a deliverable. Does that help? Okay, so the mm -hmm. idea is this would be something that is written in a format that starts to look like the, how it would appear in the plan itself. I think we would work through the details of that, but the idea is yes, that the, that the content of, and the agreement on what those buckets are, what those focus areas are, are confirmed. I think um, <clears throat> just to add to that, it goes back to your point, Andrea, about trying to establish uh, you know, the priorities for the next five to 10 years. So the focus areas really do do that. And then as we get into the strategies phase, they're going to be tied back to the focus areas. So if we're having to redo the focus areas, we almost have to then relook at the strategies. So that's why we want to get a pretty solid confirmation of the focus areas. That would be great if we can get there. Any other questions? Or? Well, yeah. um, I, I have a feeling this, this may end up either um, starting kicking off a, the the public process discussion a little early but I mean I have questions about the the engagement windows in the context of deliverables insofar as uh, the vision I have in my head is this engagement window opens the public gives their input the, cl the window closes the staff does their work the staff comes out with a synop with an aggregation of what came out of that public process and at that point um, so that we don't, so that we have those efficiencies in the process, we we lock some of those things in stone, and we move on to the next step, and the next engagement window. And um, I would like for the the community to be clear on what uh, what's on the table for engaging at each step in the process. When that window closes, what is going to end up being set in stone so that when we move on to the next process, because I, I think traditionally in Boulder processes, there's just been this rehashing yeah. that happens. Rehash, rehash, rehash. And if you show up enough times, um, squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, all these things, like uh, you can you can force a return to the beginning. And I would like for us to... to get it right or as close to right as we can at each step in the process by being clear with the community about okay this is where we bring these things to the table this is where we have these discussions and then we're all going to agree as a community that we're going to lock this in and move on to step b um so that's the vision i have in my head so a i want to check the accuracy of that vision uh b i want to see how um how staff will maintain accountability for the community for that process um, and how we will communicate to the, the community, you know, this, this whole what's on the table, what's off the table, what we've locked in stone for moving on. Sorry, super rambling, but these are all the things that are floating around in my head. Yeah, <clears throat> almost the opposite of what she just said. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not arguing against it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Um, so, so I guess in in particular, thinking about the the future trends, and then thinking about how we had, all, in theory, had already finished our community values and ideas. I kind of feel almost like that's putting the cart before the horse with respect to some things. With some things, it's not. But I could imagine having a really big discussion about, okay, here's what our values are with respect to, you know, what kinds of conservation practices we're going to do. And then in future trends, we're like, oh, global warming and all this stuff that we just set up as a value is actually not relevant um, or, is, or is differently relevant. And, and that, I think, could play out in terms of recreation management. That could play out in terms of, like, our ecosystem management and all the values that I think our community holds without the information about the future trends and how things need to focus change over the years might mean that we come up with a plan in the first phase. Then the second phase, we're, like, hamstrung 
to come up with something that works given future trends, or we're not addressing like population growth pop properly when we set our values. So I was wondering, that's my sort of counterpoint to what you're saying is, is sort of like I see how the second step might inform the first, um, and but in theory we'd be done with the first and then therefore could no longer inform it. So that's a great conversation that we have had with the process committee members and we want to have in more depth here in a little bit. So that particular thing I need to table if that's okay um, because we are going to actually get into that in a little bit in more depth. Um, how we frame the community conversation, that's a, that's a major question we need your help with tonight is making sure that we're in agreement with that. I think the concept in sort of a, a in kind of a macro level, it, it, what you're bringing up is, is whether or not we want to at each stage agree to set things in stone or if we want to commit to a more iterative process where we're revising as we go. I think the proposal that we're making is that at the focus area stage, that's absolutely when we lock things in because we need that. Um, and as I, I, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, but I, I think that's, that's where the real efficiency comes. Um, the more, um, those other, other engagement windows, it sort of depends on the nature of the engagement I get, you know? Aaron? Yeah. No, I appreciate your point, Kevin. I yeah. think um, it might be nice to refer to the Ag Plan as an example of that, where we got to a point where we felt very comfortable about most things, but said, hey, lease rates and uh, diversified veg, we need to do more investigation of that. It would be nice in that first phase to get everything done, but we probably have a few items that we say need a bit more investigation, but we'll kind of tentatively approve these two, but we'll lock in the rest. And that's the sort of adjustments we make as we get into the process. And I think that keeps us going then to allow for any areas where we don't have full confidence. But the goal is to get as much confidence as possible. Darren, if you don't mind, I'd like to speak to Andrea's point yeah. around being clear about those opportunities for engagement. Because that is one of the recommendations that the uh, public participation working group did address so that we don't have that issue. What can we do so we don't have that issue where people are coming back at the 11th hour and saying, you know, we, we want something else other than what the process delineated. And so one of the things that we have discussed is being very clear at each phase or opportunity in engagement to be clear about what it is we're addressing, what we're trying to obtain, and then what we'll do with that information, and saying so that that idea of the window is that you can open it and shut it. I mean, I think you're trying to get to that, that that could be really good, but it's on us to be very clear with the public about what those opportunities and when those are. And we have started to have those conversations, so we're, it's in, it's in here, um, and we're talking about it. I mean. Yep. And I think you're saying that's a very good goal, it's just really hard to do. Oh, particularly yeah, in this absolutely. City. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we're, we're a pilot project for the recommendations coming out of the working group, and so we're willing to give it a try. Yeah. And we'll see how we go, and we'll learn from our experience. But it is at the forefront of thinking about what the objective is at each phase. So. And, and I think this is the reason why the process committee has been so vital, because having two members of council and two members um, of the board who can speak to the process and help it, it's not just staff maintaining that accountability. I think we're really going to rely upon the board and council to help with that because uh, we are engaged in a kind of systematic, a system approach mm -hmm. to, to making this public process work. So I think that's, that's the value of having the support of the city's new engagement, engagement manager or Sarah in her new position as the engagement manager and, um, and the close working relationship with the process committee because uh, we, we kind of need to be walking um, arm in arm on this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, is, it is my hope because of this process committee and early buy-in from council uh, uh, on a process is that as we as we walk through this this process, I'm sure that that not everybody in the community will be 100% happy with what what we decide to advance. And I would hate for those people to to think, oh, well, I just have to go to council because they have the the final say. Well, I mean, you know, in some contexts that's good, but I mean, it's a way to subvert a process. Um, so I just want us all to, as a community to work together in the same context and not think, oh, all I have to do is just go to council at the, 
at the end and not have to participate actively in the, in the rest of it from the beginning. And, and I think if we can show, as you've got here, that iteration between uh, our board and staff and a product and council approval and then back into the process and mm -hmm. council approval, the more that's visible to the public, I think it does tend to counteract a little bit that feeling, I'm just going to run around this process. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. you know, we'll hope anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I love the extremely frequent co collaboration with council that from our colleagues and, you know, hope to have a couple of those joint study sessions with council for all of us yeah. to bring that nexus. And maybe we want to add those um, points on this graphic to show, because actually what I just heard is we're opening and closing those windows together. And so really having those um, backstops on this process as well so that we're, we're checking in and it's very clear like that. We, we, we all agree we're moving forward. And mm -hmm. I mean, I agree with you completely and, and what you said too is, um, so I think maybe that might be a way to um, not add more, but just show that those engagement windows are also not just staff closing the window yeah. on the yeah. public. It's actually, we're all in, you know, moving together forward on the process. What do you think process people? Is that consistent with your meetings to date or? I don't know if we've gotten to that level, but I think there is a general openness to that dialogue back and forth. But I agree, the, the earlier we make that explicit, I think the better, because it puts all of us on notice as to what our roles and responsibilities are. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, that, and that's helpful. What, what I'd like to do, because we're tearing into community dialogue, is to set up that in a little bit more detail. So this is the next part where I, I'd like to try and get through the slides, and then we'll have a good discussion, if that's okay. But obviously, if you can't, you know, <laughs> can't, you know, it's, it's okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so this is getting, I think, a little bit to what you were alluding to, and, and, that, and that is that it's very important to us as staff that we design an inclusive process and that we get to a place where we are moving beyond this idea of mine or yours or I, I use the system in this way, you use it in that way, or it means this to me and that to you, and more an agreement about this is ours together, this is our land, this is our uh, these are our decisions to make together. And we're starting to investigate what that means to be inclusive and how do we do that. This is a graphic that um, one of our staff members found from a city in Australia. And it really talks about what it means to feel included. And it means that if, if I feel included, I have a say in what happens. I have a say in the decisions in my community. That in and of itself is a very powerful thing to, to, to be able to say. That I'm informed, that I'm connected to my community, that I'm involved in making uh, it a welcoming and safe community. And that also puts an onus on us as staff, as, as you as board members, to then also think about how we can make, the, make our community members feel included. And that means trying to understand differences and similarities, um, showing respect by treating everyone fairly, embracing all abilities to participate, and creating opportunities to share with each other. And so we're really seeing this idea of inclusion in a lot of different ways. And we also mean that in terms of we want this process to feel like yours as board members as much as it feels like ours, staff members, and, and that there are opportunities to participate from all angles uh, in terms of where, wherever you are um, in, in your station. And so our general engagement strategy at the beginning is really the idea is that we do a lot of broad outreach in ways that we haven't always done in other planning processes and that we use that to build relationships, to build trust, to build interest in the process itself, get people signed up for the email list, get them knowing where the website is, make sure they are aware of the resources that are out there, the events that are happening, the opportunities to engage, and, and, and reach them in lots of different ways so that we bring into the conversation voices that haven't always been there in the past. And that as we move through the process, as we get to focus areas, for example, and we start to build strategies, that the nature of the engagement starts to change a little bit because the conversation then needs to make, we need to build understanding and alignment around what agreements we're making as a community. And so uh, the, the 
the broad outreach that we've done in the beginning has set a good foundation for us to bring those same people to the table, but the, the way we have those conversations changes a little bit as we get um, further down the road. And that first process we are describing as sort of having a micro-engagement feel. And what we mean by that is these these opportunities to talk to people at trailheads, to at, uh, on the trails perhaps, to tie into the work we're already doing through our education, outreach, and volunteer programs, the ways we already interact with the public, say, at the Ranger Cottage. Um, to partner with Growing Up Boulder to reach youth and families. So Growing Up Boulder is an organization we worked with in the North Trail Study Area Plan. They are um, a partnership with Boulder Valley School District, the city of Boulder, um, and they have also recommended this micro-engagement approach at the, at the beginning because they feel like it's a way to kind of maximize the way that we engage a broader range of, um, of, of young people and families. We also have a partnership with the Youth Opportunities Advisory Board, which is a group of high school students set up to advise the city on um, uh, decisions that affect uh, young people's lives. And we could find ways to, to work with them. Um, as far as underrepresented communities, we, we might look for ways to attend festivals, events, or neighborhood programming that's already in place and find ways to build relationships and open up dialogue at, at those places. Um, we've also submitted a grant to roll out what's called the Promotoras uh, model, and we will know later in December whether we've gotten that grant. And that's an opportunity to build up uh, existing leaders in the Latinx community who have already the knowledge and relationships in the community. They are tasked with communicating health and well-being issues with their peers, and how do we use them to and empower them to have some of these conversations? With, with their peers. Um, and so, again, we'll know a little bit more in December whether that grant has come through. When we say inclusiveness, we also mean with staff. And so we wanted to share, share with you the framework that we've set up to engage staff. And it's, it's, it's extensive, and that's because we also, as you were pointing out, want this and need this to be a staff plan that drives our work planning. And so we do, throughout the process, plan to engage with our full department. We've had a couple of meetings, for example, at our all staff meetings. Um, we have an extended team set up that we meet with monthly, and that includes subject matter experts, one representative from every work group around the department, and they are going to help us also craft uh, and refine the recommendations that, that we work through in the, in the process. We have a core team and work with that core team and the director often um, and as needed. We have a management team of all work group supervisors and we're just about to start giving them um, monthly updates. We've got uh, also the director's team, uh, service area managers and other staff that work with Tracy. We meet with them monthly to have discussions. We also, as I mentioned earlier, are involved uh, in the citywide master planning committee, and so that's where we have those sort of cross-pollinating conversations with other planners to adjust or learn from past processes uh, as we go forward. Mark was alluding to Sarah Huntley. She is now the city's uh, citywide engagement manager, and that is a position that has evolved from the public participation working group recommendations, and so she is attending our process committee meetings monthly to help align there. We also are meeting with our city manager and have met um, with department directors from around the city as well. And so we just wanted to share, too, that we're really trying to bring and coordinate a lot of feedback to the conversation so that as we start working with the community, we're really setting up opportunities to build alignment and understanding. I wonder if it, I don't know if you would normally, Sorry. We normally do this, but I'm wondering whether it would be useful to have an a, an org chart specific to this project, mm -hmm. possibly with people's email addresses. Uh, it, so these are often somewhat confusing, even for those of us who are pretty deeply into this, about how these different pieces, uh, you know, how people from different roles are coming together so people know who it is you're supposed to be contacting if they want to contact a specific person. To, there's a specific role they're interested in accessing as opposed to blasting out to everyone. 
That's a great suggestion. You know, I think maybe that's something that we can talk about with the extended team and sort of figure out what the best approach is. You know, certainly I'm always available and, and I can be the best, probably the best first contact. And then I think that it would be an opportunity to say, okay, you know what, I can't answer that question. Let me let me help you find that best person. I think that's probably the most efficient way of doing it. Um, to start with, but um, you know, I'm certainly open and could have the, the, the conversation with our staff if that feels, um, okay. yeah, if we, if we should adjust that. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to share, uh, and this um, is something that we've spoken about with our process committee as a, recently as of uh, earlier today, but that we want to be clear also that one of the recommendations the Public Participation Working Group has made is that we start the conversation with the community by creating a foundation, as they call it, a foundation of information and inquiry. And so the ways that staff have, are, have proposed doing that, it's kind of in a three-part way. And one is that we start, as always, with that city charter and see that as an opportunity to inform and educate the public about, that, about those charter purposes and through the system overview report show how, what current conditions look like in relation to those charter purposes and make sure that that information is out there in order to, to frame conversation. The conversation also about values is another opportunity for staff, and I'll show this in a, in a moment, but to, for, for staff to also bring some conversations to light to help frame the conversation with the community and to say that, you know, we've, we've had some conversations internally about what we, how we see our values shaping up in relation to the charter and, and moving forward. And so let that be a place to start and, and let the community refine and explore and, and, and add to, expand. But instead of starting with a blank slate, we've got some ideas that we'd like to perhaps bring to the table. And then through the emerging, this idea of emerging trends and policy questions, and, and this is again a conversation that we'd like to have with you here in a little bit, but that there is also some additional information to be brought, uh, that could be brought to bear in terms of future conditions that move beyond current conditions as we've got in the system overview. And that that's another opportunity to inform and educate, as well as to then engage around what that means for the future. So what are the related policy questions that come out of that information? And and the discussion around those policy questions is really where there's another opportunity to involve the public. So why values? Why have a values-based planning process? <laughs> it, it, it helps us hear from everyone, and, and, and that means those who have been engaged from the very beginning, as well as reaching new people in new ways. Um, it, it's our hope that by starting the conversation around values that we could also inspire new thinking and new stewards and really start to build that conversation about this is our land. Um, it also is an opportunity to set the tone and to find commonalities. And this again goes back to trying to see ourselves as complex human beings that have similarities and commonalities with a lot of other people and to hopefully start to build some bridges in ways that perhaps we've seen controversy in the past, to, to avoid the, the kind of controversy we may have seen in the past and, and to um, build that, the, the awareness of the things we have in common. We also want to build excitement about future projects. And so the way you do that is to help people get excited from the very beginning and crafting our work plan going forward. Because as we are done with this master plan and start uh, start implementing, there I'm sure are going to be opportunities, we hope, for additional partnerships and relationships with the community or volunteerism and additional stewardship opportunities that we'd like to capitalize on. So let's build that excitement now and have everybody help us craft the rules of the road get, to get there. It also starts to help us develop a framework for future decision making. And so by agreeing on what our common values are, that that gives us a nice touch point in the future for, for, for example, staff or board to make um, operational decisions that we feel confident are in alignment with staff and community values. So as I mentioned, we've had some of these very initial staff uh, interactions and exercises around trying to understand what our values are. And as you know, at the retreat, we also did that exercise with the full board. And so what we try to do is start to sort those into buckets to make some sense of them. We've done some initial analysis, and, and this is what we're showing here. We're not 
at tonight, we're not hoping to go into the actual content of this, but more to show you that this is a way we might frame an, an additional exercise, or additional exercises with the community to say that this is this is where you know some ideas that we have. But again, what else? What are we missing? How important to you are these things? Um, so the way we might then frame those questions to the community is, you know. Based on what we, we, these are ideas from staff, but what do you love about OSMP and why is that important? What is important about open space and mountain parks? And how can staff improve the way that we're upholding open space values? And by that it doesn't mean my values or your values, it means our values. How does staff continue to deliver on a broad range of values? And then, you know, inviting the public to say, you know, this is our plan together, so what else do we as staff, do we as community members need to keep in mind as we start uh, working through this master plan process? And that might invite questions about, you know, future conditions that we need to keep in mind. You know, maybe it's around climate change or it's around financial sustainability. It's a, an open-ended question, perhaps, that could invite some ideas that would allow us to advance the process and respond to it. <laughs> So this is the, one of the conversations we really want to have with you tonight. And so um, another way we might frame the conversation is that we might come um, to the table, in addition to having the current conditions that we share in the system overview, we could also start out at the same time with some information uh, that frames out general trends and what we're calling strategic opportunities. And then ask those values-based questions kind of in relation uh, to, to those. So that it's yet another way of framing that conversation. And Kevin, I think this gets back to what you were asking before, right? And so this would be the, the time that we could go ahead and bring some additional information around future trends uh, to bear at the very early onset of the process. And, and this is a suggestion to, to um, be fair that Tom and Kurt brought to us as a refinement to the process. And I think this is, we need your help um, fl fleshing this out a little bit more. Because option two is what we were originally proposing, which would look a slightly differently. And that would be that yes, we bring the system overview out and that we let that frame the conversation around values. And in response to that, we would then bring additional information to bear around future trends that might help us frame up those strategic opportunities so it would be a slightly different approach and so it's um, something that we started to discuss today at the process committee meeting and what we heard from our council members is that perhaps there's a hybrid to this um, and so that's what I'd love to walk away with tonight is is some uh, an understanding from you about what feels comfortable about doing this because we also want to be sensitive to the um, to community dynamics and we we are very uh, uh, again with a lot of integrity are saying that we need the community to be involved in this process and so so we want to um, we want to frame it carefully so that we op leave it open ended enough that the, the community knows that there's room for that dialogue. If we were to bring some additional uh, some <coughs> policy questions to bear at the beginning, we have had some initial brainstorming post-it notes <laughs> conversations, you know, with staff in order to um, frame up the report and other things. And so, you know, we've we've summarize those into a list of questions, which again are really just a way to show that um, we could ask a set of broad questions at the beginning in a high enough uh, neutral way that might help the community understand the level at which the master plan will go. Sorry, one second. Thank you. We need your guidance about how to do that. So depending on what we get to tonight, we've, we want to just give you a little bit of a, um, an idea of what we see the first part of engagement looking like next year. And of course, this will 
uh, refine based on your, your guidance. But what we would, we would share the system overview report depending, again, on your guidance, we might bring a report to bear or an additional information to bear about some future conditions that we, we um, can anticipate. Um, we would like to have a series of kickoff events and get some excitement building around those and um, make that a, a, a fun way of starting off the process. Um, we're also seeing this idea of storytelling as an opportunity, and Carrie speaks about this really eloquently, so if you want to help me with this, feel free. The idea is that it's a really nice human way of having conversations with people. People, it's a, you know, regardless of kind of your education experience level, people love to tell stories. And so it might be a way, an avenue to start that conversation. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. We also absolutely want to have an element of digital engagement. We, this is another aspect where we're having to coordinate with the rest of the city. And that's because, um, <coughs> whereas we, used mind mixer you might remember in the North Trail study area process. That tool itself is not, uh, we call it an inspire boulder. Um, that tool is not, no longer available to us. And so the city is going through a process to um, receive bids from the community and narrow those down to a tool that, that will be available to the city. They are um, very aware of our, our needs for the master plan and so hopefully that'll be in, pl in place by early next year so that we can use that tool. We'll do the best that we can. Um, we also want to make use of social media, both in terms of sharing information, but also gathering feedback. And so um, we're, we're starting to brainstorm about how that might work. This idea of photo and video documentation is something I, I'm, again, credit Tracy with, because I think it's really important that we emphasize the ways that we can communicate the feedback that we get through these broad outreach efforts um, in ways that help level the playing field um, in, because we know that some of the folks we might reach are less likely to come to a public hearing or to write the board and council. And so how do we bring those voices to the table? And could we do that in a, in a, in a um, scrapbook way, in a video documentation way, so that we might play it at a board meeting, we might play it at a council meeting, we might play it at another public meeting because you know those same folks might not even come to a public event. So how, um, how do we bring those ideas forward? And another... Uh, tool that we're looking to develop is this idea of an inclusion checklist. And that's because regardless of what we're doing, whether it's an event or a set of materials that we're making available on the web, that we want to have some questions in the front of our minds, things like, is the event being held in a universally accessible location? Um, are, are translation services needed? Do we, uh, have we made it clear that assistive devices for hearing and visual uh, disabilities are available as needed? Are we providing uh, childcare? All these sorts of things that might help us build an inclusive environment regardless of the kind of effort, that uh, outreach or engagement that we're doing. So that's where I wanna stop for right now. Um, I first wanna see if you have any questions. Um, and, and have a general conversation. And then I want to do a pros and cons discussion with you about the two options that I shared with you about how to frame the conversation. So questions first. <coughs> or clarifications, refinements, if you want to add anybody. Okay. Okay. talking about inclusion and checklist and some of these other things. But, you know, I think, like you say, there are people who are uncomfortable coming in and speaking. Um, and, oops. Uh, and so my question would be, um, if we have a disenfranchised group, what mechanism would we have to plug them in so they feel, I'm almost thinking like an ambassador kind of thing, where there would be a point person at OSMP who we could say, who wasn't maybe a, in a director role or something, where we could say, this person has a question and, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a really lovely thought. It's similar to the grant application I mentioned before, where they, that model is essentially set up where there are peer leaders, for example, in the Latinx community right. that 
are, are already prepared to, to have those kinds of conversations. Right. I think one of the things, excuse me, that Mark, you're, I, I love hearing you talk about is that, you know, if we kind of, if we get off of first, so to speak, in, in building relationships and opening the doors in ways we haven't in the past, that that's a lovely way of thinking about success, that we, we it, just to let them know that we are interested. Mm -hmm. um, is perhaps a, a nice start, depending on uh, the nature of the dynamics. Um, we also, as uh, our education and outreach staff, also have existing relationships with a lot of communities that um, we haven't always engaged in a planning process in, in the past. And so that would be another opportunity to build on the trust that they've been working to build over the last number of years um, to invite them into the process. So I think it's a multi-part answer. I don't know if you want to... No, no, it's a good question, Molly, and it's a good answer. And the one thing I've, you know, a term that's come up quite often now is barriers to access. Mm -hmm. And um, if you explore that a bit more deeply, what you start to realize is we identify what we think are the barriers for a group to access, but it's actually talking to that group to understand what they have as barriers which are invisible to us and overcoming those. And so a lot of this process through Kerry, through Darren, through Panica, more than I've ever seen is really trying to get into what you're describing of how do we go that extra mile? Mm -hmm. How do we do those personal meetings? And it, it will take a lot more work, but we've kind of committed to that. And we've got direction from the process committee and from directly like from Mary Young, for instance, at council. So we'll, we'll do our best. You're never perfect, but mm -hmm. we want to give it the best shot. I guess my, my just pushing it a little bit further would be, it would be nice to have one particular person you know, rather than this comes up and we call this person, that person calls another person, you know, if there was a point person who, if there was a fallout, because I know with the Boulder Valley comp process, there were a lot of people during those meetings who didn't really, they didn't really <laughs> fit a mold. They weren't in any particular group, but they were still interested in the process. So. I just want to make sure that there's a catch-all for the filtration and someone that could really follow that up so it's not just, oh, I'll get back to you, but then doesn't really happen. I, I think we, you know, I'd perhaps, sorry, just an example to go back to the Ag Plan was working with the ranchers and, mm -hmm. and recognizing that we needed to do more outreach as a department and working on that and then identifying who in the ranching community uh, we could be a leader there and then building trust. So that perhaps is an approach we can take, that we, mm -hmm. you know, which is getting that one-to-one -one contact mm -hmm. to, to build the bridge and the trust with whichever group it is and then expanding it out to that group itself through the person who's the contact for them as well. So I, I guess I have two thoughts on this. One from my most recent experience with the North TSA was that there was a constant um, discourse uh, that was not necessarily uh, friendly um, about how different forms of communication were to be cataloged, represented, and recorded. And so people would say like, oh, here's this online thing, you can go and vote, and then everyone would rush out and vote, and then they'd be like, but the vote doesn't mean anything really, we just want your opinion. And then people got really angry about that, and then other people said, well, if I can't come in person, am I not being weighed as much because you just said the vote doesn't count? And I don't know how to resolve any of that, but I think having an explicit understanding somewhere about how this works, I think it would be an outright lie to say that people showing up aren't having more things heard than if you never say anything. And therefore, having some way to say, we're trying to accommodate all of you, and here's how we're considering people's opinions from different sources. So if you can't show up, here's how you're being represented might be really helpful. Um, and the, the second thing building on that is that I think there's a real challenge among a lot of people here in that either they don't feel represented by any group that has some advocacy or whatever for that is going to be talking to you, or they feel that the advocacy group that might be talking to you does not represent their opinions. Um, and, and I guess finally, they might not even be aware that there's an advocacy group for, for their interests. And so, uh, and, and having been involved in the cycling community now for here for a decade, 
I see a huge discrepancy between a lot of what I hear on the trail from people and what is consistently presented by cycling advocacy. And I'm not saying that one's right or wrong. I think there's room for both, but like you're missing a big portion of the picture by addressing anything just dealing with these advocacy groups. And I'm not saying you shouldn't deal with them because they're very valuable and they know a lot. I'm just saying there might be a real challenge to try and find a way, don't just focus on them, but like find the back door anyway. I, I think that's the real intention of the inclusivity. Yeah. Is and, that we're aware of that. And I think one more thing to add to that, if you're going to do trails, visits, and stuff, go outside a city. So go to county trails because there's a definite segregation of users because of the different types of trails and different access, and you might get a, an opinion about how to change city based on how your neighbors are managing that might be beneficial. Did you want to respond? No, to just what you, um, you brought up at the study session today, Darren, uh, Jane, the city manager, asking for us to do more survey work with the public to confirm like trade-offs, et cetera. Sure. So I will share that more broadly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and that is that when we recently met with our city manager and were bringing her up to speed on the conversations that we had had to date with the process committee, we had heard, um, for example, Tom, a suggestion from you that we need to wrestle with this idea of trade-offs in our process and how are we going to do that. And she brought to light and reminded us that the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan went through a process of doing a, a statistically valid community survey to help explore those trade-offs. And that seemed to have been widely received, well received. The process committee themselves for the comp plan were actually involved in crafting those questions. And um, the council members that were there this morning um, seemed to suggest that they also support that idea for this process too. Um, and that would be an opportunity to try and make sure that we've got that broad cross-section because it's a valid approach. Um, and so that would be a, a, it'd be a strong element to the process. Yeah. So uh, you've already spoken directly to, to my comment, which is uh, what, are, what are the metrics for success for a successful public outreach? I mean, for me, an easy one would be a statistically valid public survey, which is done before this process starts. Has anyone ever talked to you about open space? Do you feel your priorities on open space are heard? And then after, same question, well, hopefully we see a huge bump because we've talked to a significant cross-section of our community. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I've, I've been talking to, you know, I have young children and I, and I work and I've been talking to all the crazy mom friends I have that we feel like we have no time to go and participate in process. And I'm like, how can you be outreached to? And it's like online daycare pickup, <laughs> park. And it's like, park. these are uh -huh. the three things, you uh -huh. know? And, it, and it's like, well, you know, you might not be able to do those things. So how do we reach these communities and how do we know that we've reached them? Mm -hmm. So the metrics for success, I'm really curious to hear about mm -hmm. that. Um, and I, I appreciate that. You know, I think that um, we are trying, we, we, we are bringing, it's a little bit different um, from what you've described, but the two valid surveys that will be brought to bear at the beginning of this process are the resident survey, which has already been released and you guys have gotten a, um, an update on that, but that, that has largely informed the development of our system overview report and, and will um, inform the master plan itself. And then um, in second quarter of next year, the system-wide visitation survey and visitor survey will come, uh, that report will come available also. And so it's not asking the, the question exactly the way that you asked it, but we will have information from both of, both of those sources in terms of, um, you know, uh, activity types and levels of use uh, and um, uh, <laughs> priorities as it relates to um, our charter purposes and some idea, a lot of information to, to bring to bear. Um, and so I, the other thing I wanted to mention also, and Carrie might be able to speak to this a little bit more, is that another one of the recommendations that's come out of the public participation working group is that we make sure we evaluate our engagement 
and, and give opportunities at an event or at other locations to say, did this work? If so, great, tell us why. If not, what could we have done better? And so it's a little bit simpler approach to what you were just describing, but we're hoping to support the city, the rest of the city in, in doing that so we can provide some data to them and to ourselves to adjust as we go forward. Is that? Yeah, that's fair. Is evaluation is an important part of the process. Um, and I, oh, oh, I had a thought, but it might have gone. But it had to do, with Kevin, something that you mentioned, which, um, oh, okay, I've got it, which is, Asking, and Molly, it somewhat speaks to what you were talking about, but asking what would work for you in terms of engagement, not us making assumptions, which is, Mark, what you were saying, that we think there are certain barriers, but we ought to be actually asking, which is what you did when you asked the moms, what's the best way to outreach to you? And you nailed those three things. Well, we might not ever come up with that because... We just wouldn't, like, I wouldn't, my kids are older. I wouldn't come up with those. So I think some of that is asking those questions before we even engage. And now keeping in mind we have a lot going on in resources, but it is something that we've talked about and thought we should be asking, and we've thought about including that on the inclusion checklist. So. In all of our surveys that you were describing, are they already out? I mean, there's no opportunity to add that question to any... Yeah. Oh, no, idea. but I I also want to share the... Oh, go ahead, Danica. Oh, I was just going to say, I know that um, Alpine Balsam, the project the city's doing, is asking that exact... They're putting out a survey like that right now, and so we can keep our eyes on that, but it's asking how do you want to get information, how do you like to stay involved, what are you most interested in, um, and so... You know, we may we may try to do something similar, or we can learn from that information. But I think it's really important to ask those questions because we can't presume to know what those are. And then again, we have another source of data to be able to come back to and and hopefully give, um, you know, go back to the metrics of success. Like, did we, you know, did we do what people asked us to do? I mean, that would. And so we can, I think, check in on that actual process, which I believe is still underway. Speaking to that, too, the Alpine Balsam uh, questionnaire that they have put out, one of the questions they also asked was if you were a participant and you didn't see your desired outcome at the end, <coughs> but what would that, is there a process that you could support even if you didn't, you know, get what you wanted from the process? And so that's something that they're asking, which I think is going to be really interesting to see the results of. It's very brave, but it's it's an IAP2 <laughs> supported question because it's important. Um, even if you didn't get what you wanted, what process could you support? And it helps address some of the things that we've already talked about this evening. One, one thing I think is important to note in this conversation is, um, I know my time at Portland Metro, we, you can get a statistically valid survey, but that statistically valid survey might not be the right the the complete demographic, an inclusive yeah. demographic. And there is ways to weight it and things to do. But the reality is it's the actual direct door-to-door, -door, as it were, outreach, which sometimes is combining that anecdotal with a statistical to get a really inclusive approach. I think the good news for us, where we're kind of on the front foot as a department, in, in some ways leading the city, we've got staff who speak nationally about Latinx, folks experiencing disabilities, youth programs, working with like the Fall Nature Center. So there's, there's good news here. The department's been doing some good outreach work over the last 20 years to put us in a place where we've got contacts to make these connections in the engagement process. And that is kind of exciting for us because we might have not utilized that as much in the past for, uh, from like a planning perspective, more purely from a program engagement perspective. So there, here's where we've got some good head starts to get into that. And the last thing I wanted to say is also that in the comprehensive planning process, they did ask that question. They, ha they did put out a questionnaire about how you wanted to be engaged, and so we have those results that, that we will also incorporate. Yeah. Yep. So be before we go to this very important question that you've brought up the slide, yeah. um, one thing I think about with the, the engagement process is um, the... I forgot the, the name of the program that you're trying to get the grant funding for. Um, Promotoras. Yeah. Um, so wh where, where you have the community leader who could then, who is the influencer for a group, right? This is true in any community. Mm -hmm. And finding those influencers in all key communities is a great, is a great gateway, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So I, I guess let's just not limit it to, you know, the select few communities. Let maybe try and find the influencers and all the communities. Yeah, absolutely. And what it also makes me want to remind you all is that one of our questions on the table tonight as it relates to our process is how the board wants to be involved mm -hmm. um, so that we could also, you know, a, a question to you is how, you know, what relationships do you have or opportunities do you have um, to continue to bring people into the fold? Just a final note there is we've, you know, recently been looking at partnerships. It's a citywide effort. And uh, like Kerry coming on board, myself coming on board, you know, it's in the title. And um, we were even surprised when we did an internal, just quick questionnaire to realize we had about 250 partners, even if it's just a handshake. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to understand ourselves, how many we have and how to better utilize that. That's great. So we're starting to work on things like that. Any other, we're not, we, we try not to do public participation, Karen, thanks. <laughs> um, so, um, any other broad questions that, or reactions to what we've shared so far? Before we do this, it's not the end. We can come back if you need anything else. I mean, I just had one sort of like overall reaction idea. I think that might help set some people's minds at ease. As I think one thing you've talked about before is that you're, you know, attempting to engage in an adaptive management program. Um, where as things change over time, um, you have a plan to, to address that. And I think when you set up something like a master plan and everything's really explicit, people get scared because they don't have a sense that there's room for change if the situation changes. And I think that you could explicitly make that a part of this initial discussion of like, we recognize that things are going to change and the whole way through this, we're going to parameterize this and give a sense of that adaptive management so that if, say, for example, um, a lot more species become endangered, like, we're going to address that. If um, we need a lot more recreation parking because, uh, you know, it gets so much more crowded, we're going to address that and within a certain range. And one thing I would say also to add to that, because I'm working on an adaptive management plan right now, is that it's really useful to have something that says, like, you don't have to say it at this point, but you say, look, we will have something that will trigger a response, and then we will evaluate the effectiveness of the response and manage from that. So people know that it's not just, oh, well, if things get worse, we'll do something. And I think saying that at the beginning of this whole discussion might help diffuse a lot of everybody's concerns about, like, you just set something in stone, and now we're stuck with this forever. like. That you say, like, well, if recreation needs change, we we create a room for that. If species and habitat needs change, we create room for that. So anyway, just just in in the point that you're making here. But all these master plans have update processes with them, right? No the, this would explicitly not be update. So this is a continual adaptive management. So if next, if if a month after this plan came out, a trigger was tripped, a species became endangered. Um, a habitat burned down and we lost 80%. We already have a plan. There's no update. It's just this is what happens. If we see the recreation parking needs go through the roof for Marshall Mesa, we already have a, a plan for how to address a parking issue so that it's not in 10 years we're going to update this. It's just as the plan goes forward, this gets tripped, we do that. If it gets untripped, we undo it or whatever. And that's what adaptive management is. It's not when we have a problem, we come up with a new plan. It's we already have a plan for when the problem comes, or at least for how to address a problem when it comes. And while I'm very sympathetic to that, trying to define the entire realm of trigger yeah. possibilities yeah. in open space yeah. and mountain parks, we would be yeah. the first that's a tried to do it. Time of <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, I don't <laughs> disagree. Uh, I guess, I, you know, my thinking on it is that that's something that, like, actual master plans are doing around the country already. And things like planning for a range of <laughs> human visitation and changing recreation interest is something you could say, instead of we're waiting 10 years for an update, it's like, if this happens, we, we recognize that we might have to in instantly engage in a new planning process that's not about the update. Because you wouldn't say, like, we've already come up with a, a plan for a new parking lot in Marshall Mesa. That'd be ridiculous. But you say, like, if such an event happens that parking in Marshall Mesa needs to be addressed within this plan, we have the wherewithal to address parking or whatever. I'm, that's a really bad example, but. 
Um, so I think this will be um, an opportunity to kind of remind us that we might get to different levels of detail and, and confirmation uh, as it relates to some of our strategies, that certainly what's required in order to do that is a, is a fair amount of data to support what that trigger is. And again, we may or may not have the adequate amount of data to do that, or we make, might make a decision to make a different approach as it relates to different elements of our plan. Um, I think it's a great conversation to continue to have, especially as we start developing those strategies. Did you want to add something? No, it's just, I thought it was interesting because you said the master plan can almost create fear by being a master plan. Yeah. I'm, I'm scared to death right now. <laughs> no, I'm literally, I think yeah. this is right, one of the, the things... On, it's okay. Yeah. We're all going to be okay. I, I, I think this is one of the things that when I look at our previous plans, I feel that we're very boxed in by them. Instead of freed to be like, oh, here's what happens when this problem arises. I feel like what happens is, nope, this is what the plan says. And I think that's a really bad way for a dynamic system that we have to function in. Um, and I, I understand there's rules you have to follow, but setting up a, an explicit discussion with the public that... We recognize if something goes wrong, we're not waiting for an update. We're going to address this problem, and here's the types of problems that might need to be up, uh, addressed, and here's the way, way, means we would address them by setting up a sub-plan or something. That might remove a lot of people's fear. Hmm. I had a couple of thoughts. Um, I guess um, maybe more questions, too, but I, I think that that is one of the goals is the plan is it talks about what strategies follow so that you can, you know, ad you address these. The plan doesn't set the strategies. I mean, it sets the strategies in stone, but not the actions. And the plan also does it by, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like fiscally constrained. I mean, you have different levels, which shows some adaptiveness, and maybe there's ways to inc incorporate some of the adaptiveness you're talking about into those tiers of how you think about things. So if we have... <coughs> more resources and more time, we can do more study or we can do this. I don't, I'm throwing ideas out there, but the way that that's a very typical master plan, but maybe there's ways to put adaptiveness into those tiers of, you know, allowing additional work to be done if we, you know, if we really hit this. And I don't know if that, throwing that out there is an idea. <laughs> no, I think it's good. Um, I think a way to think about it sometimes is um, we've just celebrated 50 years and the system may not be in perfect shape, but it's in pretty good shape because of community, staff, stewardship, partnerships over the years. So that gives us a level of confidence, doesn't it? Even though some plans might be a bit too specific, some might be a bit too general. So one thing I've noticed with these efforts in my career is at the end of them, you often find with a good plan that you might be affirming quite a lot of what you already do, but recognizing it or making it visible to the world and then refining it or tweaking it and making sure the best practices are in there. And we know we're setting this master plan at a strategic level. It's different to like the VMP, which had, as you know, talking to Mark about this, it had policy all the way down to very discrete actions. We're seeing this is at the policy level, like the way the Ag Plan was, strategic, and then we get to implementation at the next phase. So it also provides that level of confidence to say we are figuring it out strategically, best practices, and we'll be trying to affirm operations that we do, refine some, bring some new ones in, maybe let go of some ones that are old, that no longer work, but that master plan allows you to bring that together under one roof for us for the first time. And, you know, that's, that should allay some, you know, rather than starting from a fear-based, we can sort of start from a confidence-based in the management of the system. I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm just saying explicitly stating that everyone who's talked to me about this is scared to death. Mm. Like, no one is like, yay, a plan. Yay, I'm going to get involved. They're all like, okay, I'm going to lose a bunch. I'm not comfortable with this. I feel like this is happening at a level where there's going to be a bunch of big changes and instead of saying like oh it's going to be okay which i think something that says we're actually going to address this and we have contingencies and things like that this feels like people are scared um and and i don't think that's a good place to start with and i think answering that right away might actually help people feel more open to engagement in like, it's, it's much harder to say, hey, I'll consider this, or this isn't really what I want, but I'll talk about it, if you feel like saying that means I'm, I'm in, like, engaging in something that's going to, my fears are going to be confirmed. And, and I think that's what I'm most concerned about, 
at the beginning of this process is how to diffuse the fear and get everyone to sit down and be like, all right, let's just throw spitballs at a wall and see what feels good. Instead of like, if I don't toe the line, I'm going to lose what's really important to me. That's all. And, and I appreciate you bringing it to our attention, and I think it's another opportunity to, um, you know, at, you, as board members to help move this process along and to build that confidence that Mark is talking about. And, you know, I think that you know in a lot of ways you have relationships that we don't. And so if you can continue to sort of tap into those and learn the ways that you can build that confidence and allay those fears, if you can bring those back to us and share those ideas that, that work, that, that would be tremendously appreciated. And I think it's also an, an opportunity to say that, again, we are trying to bring in people to the conversation that haven't, haven't always been there. And I think that it's also, um, it, it hopefully, it is a way to, to start from the things that matter to us most from a very fundamental level. What are your value system? What is your value system as it relates to OSMP? And that hopefully by exposing that and confirming that, that we all start to see that there, that that's a lovely place to start from and that the resulting focus areas and strategies that result from that are rooted in something that means something to all of us. So um, in the interest of time, I know it's starting to get late, and I can t already tell by uh, your energy levels it's not quite like last night. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to invite you. If you, if you want to stand up or stretch, please do so. We do have a little bit more to get through, I, I, um, but I, I do need to – I, I want to continue to move us through that. So we need your help on framing – the, the community conversation. So back to this kind of option one versus option two. And so just as a reminder, um, Danica is going to help us take notes, but I'm, I'm going to stand up. So I'm, again, feel free if you need to do this with me. Um, but the idea being is in what order do we have this conversation about um, the strategic opportunities, the trends and strategic opportunities that we as, uh, as staff um, see? And the question being, you okay? <laughs> All right. Okay, got it. I'm good, sir. Option one being <clears throat> that can everybody see this one? Okay, or is this you're okay? All right. Um, yeah. Just say a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, please. Please. I think our discussion with you was motivated in a significant way same concerns you have, that when you're at the beginning of this process, one thing you want the public to learn really soon, what is this process about? Yeah. And as you said, master plan, <laughs> we all have a different vision of what the master plan is. So I think partly what Tom and I were looking for is a way to very early on put forward some illustrations of what the master plan could be, meaning, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Meaning you take an area of strategic importance and you say why it's important to open space and you sort of talk about what it is. And then you talk about the types of strategies that might be considered in a master plan to address that. And, and what you're trying to do very briefly is sort of take people from A to the end. So they see, oh, I see. We're talking about how to deal with parking if that becomes an issue and the various strategies for dealing with overuse of an area. Uh, so by putting two or three of those issues, strategic issues, on the table early, the main purpose was to get them oriented to what the whole process is about so they're not so concerned about all the fears that, I think you're right, people will bring to the table. So there's multiple purposes for doing this, but I think that's one of the ones that was most on our mind, which is get something out there that people can relate to in a concrete way so they're not guessing where this process is going. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so what we've got going is a pro-con analysis for both. And I'd like to, to try and go through this as efficiently as we can. So what I was capturing there is that it helps explain what the master plan is about, that um, it gives people something concrete to react to. Okay, so that's what I heard. Um, what, what else on either side of option one? Um, I think a con for option one is the, the opportunity for anchoring. The, I think that's the, the whole 
social science term for it, but basically you put something out in front of somebody and then all their responses are, are from that point forward biased. That, that they're, so if we put out, you know, these general trends and strategic opportunities and then, we at, and then we ask people to say, oh, what are your values of open space? How do you connect to open space? We've already put them down a funnel. Of, and, and, you know, I mean, that is in part by design, but if you really want to have a, a community process where you're drawing in people who've never really thought that the fact that I could see the flat iron is because it's open space, um, descending down that funnel too early may be a disservice to them in identifying what their basic values are. Can I have just some clarification? I think I get what a general trend is, but what's a strategic opportunity? <laughs> so it's the same, I'll, I'll go back to this slide just to... <laughs> so I'll just bring this back up to give you an example. This might be the way we contextualize a strategic opportunity. It's, a, it's, the, it's the, the needs, the challenges, the opportunities that, that emerge from the information. Okay. Anything, did you want to add to that? I was gonna say from known, maybe also from known information. So I think Kurt earlier was talking about those overarching issues, like the, you know, some of those things might be strategic opportunities. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that might be something. Yeah, part of it is also that we, we want to build into the language discussion about opportunities and to not, um, exacerbate any of the fears that are out there. And so we'd, we'd l rather not start the conversation by saying, we've got a lot of problems we need to fix. And instead, we'd like to say, based on the information we have, what opportunities does that present? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say, in a lot of ways, the pros and the cons are just sort of the flip sides of each other. But a significant pro of option one, to me, is it's more time efficient. And I understand the if you spend a lot of time just asking people about basic values, I, I get how that sort of very bottoms-up approach may pick up something that you might miss if you started to frame the discussion a little bit sooner. But um, it is my experience on every uh, significant planning thing we've done over a lot of years now that we always treat time on the front end too leisurely and 80% of the work occurs in the last 20% of the time. And we always look back in the last couple of meetings like, damn, you know, you remember that time when we were just kind of sitting around and now it's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. And, <laughs> and a lot of those yeah. really important decisions occur, it's the same old problem mm -hmm. at 11 o'clock at night and people are exhausted and cranky, <laughs> but you still have to, yeah, you still have to make the decision on the issues that are the tough ones and have resisted sort of early resolution. And I think, you know, there's a sort of hybrid, which is the best of both worlds, of sort of initially beginning to frame the discussion with a bit of substance that people can start thinking about, all right, here's some stuff we're going to have to um, wrestle with. It's, in a sense, the counterpart to the, the why in the current version of this is very general. It doesn't, it, it's just, you know, okay, what are we going to do? Um, and this, to me, is a little bit of the trade-off. If you want to have a very general why statement, you think fairly early on need to uh, pair that with a more robust statement of, well, what is the actual substance of this that we want to inform the, the other discussions that we have? And, yeah, I mean, not to create a sense of urgency, but to avoid the sense of undue leisure that, I mean, just being honest, it's, it, it continually happens that people have this vision that we can do anything. You know, we can talk to anyone about anything at any time and anywhere, and then you're like, when it comes down to it, it's like, no. You know, we, we really actually have to make some decisions here. And it's the way of kind of pairing those two notions together so that the outreach is, is framed by some specific policy concerns. Tom? Sorry, was it, go ahead. Just to get into the meat of it then, on page six, that middle slide, is that starting to address it? Um, page six of the presentation. I know it's small, apologies for the small text. Oh, this page six. Page six, or is slide six? Sorry, I'm in the PowerPoint. Okay. I've got glasses to read that one. 
Yeah. Could you read that to us? I can't. In my. <laughs> I'll try to. Well, you can see what it gets at. It's saying here's some draft the values. The middle slide. Pardon? The middle slide of these three. Yeah, yeah. Is that? <laughs> no. I mean, I appreciate what you're trying to say, but to me, that too is too. <clears throat> yeah. Thank um, you. Peace, relaxation. I think those, a lot of those are so all-encompassing that they don't tell people why they should get involved. They're expressing values of, I mean, why we, things that do happen on an open space. But I'm not sure that tells people, well, what, what are we trying to do here? What are we facing? Yeah, what, what's the, you know, yes, walking on open space is a pleasant, oh, hopefully is a pleasant experience, but um, <laughs> that only, that doesn't take you very far in terms of developing a master plan. Well, the, the, the thing I struggle with is how do, you, how do you set the stage without, I forget what the exact like, thing the public process working group identified as a problem, but was the outcomes are already determined or, or whatever. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like if you add too much specificity right. up front, then you've that, violated that concern. Right. That, the hybrid that I, you know, to me the happy middle ground is to have a, a fairly substantive amount of framing without implying particular prescriptions of where, what you're trying to ultimately um, <coughs> do in the way of actions. So to clarify, but, Tom, would you be almost framing a series of questions around some of those things that are important to people? Yeah, to me it's like, if you were to think about one particular set of pro issues, you know, you could say, well, the visitor experience at a very general level, okay, um, that's probably too amorphous. If you were to say, well, pick an issue such as, you know, to what extent could we do something to reduce user conflict, that starts to frame a discussion that people can, you know, have an opinion about. Then there's all kinds of specific strategies that you would get to later in a process about, well, you could do this, you could do this, you do this. And it seems to me that if you're just using a phrase like visitor experience, it's too amorphous um, um, to uh, sort of drive a discussion. If you use a word like, you know, conflict, I mean, it's a negative word, but there may be a more positive way of framing that that um, that seems to me something that can drive a discussion, that people can start talking about what, if anything, you know, what's their reaction? Is that a problem for them? And what, if anything, you know, ultimately would you do about it? Another slide, which is, is the slide following the one of the two options, which, which gets at some of these things. And I think um, the first bullet there, Tom, oh, sorry, the first bullet there, Tom, it talks about a couple of things, but if, if, you, um, if you wanted to say, you know, how do we promote um, a high quality visitor experience or an enjoyable visitor experience? You know, that's a general thing. It doesn't necessarily talk about conflict. It could have a lot of other elements in it. But that, that I don't know if it's again, somewhere that's in general. there. It's somewhere, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not trying to word these at all, no. but I think it is somewhere in there is the, the happy medium of giving some substance and some focus yeah. to this without overly directing things towards a particular conclusion. Well, if I could just jump in. Um, the struggle, Andrea, that you talked about is, is just what we've been trying to deal with. We, we really don't want it to come across that there is a predetermined outcome here. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, we've also had this discussion, well, maybe there's a way that we could sort of prime the pump of the, just say, here are some such as and really give caveats around it. Like, you know, the, we haven't determined what the answers, but, you know, or what all the questions are, but here's some thoughts that we have. And so it, that's where this list of questions came from. So that we're trying to find the sweet spot and, and this conversation and the conversation with the um, process committee is, is helping. And, and I don't think this has to be coming just from staff. I mean, you've got lots and lots of data from surveys, and I bet every issue we could think of in the next hour has already been identified by the public. And so I think one way you roll this out is to say, here are the sort of challenges people t tell us about. And these are things that the department feels we're going to need to grapple with over the next 10 years. 
you know, it doesn't have to be, this is from us, this is what we're hearing, and this is what we're seeing. I think it's a fair suggestion. I definitely want to, sorry, Kevin, just one question is I, I do want to remind us, though, that as part of this process, we are hoping to engage with folks that we have not engaged with sure. previously, whether that be through surveys, planning processes, or other methods. And so I think that there are some a friendly amendment, as Mark likes to say, to, to that. Um, Kevin, what is your reaction to this? Because it's definitely important to hear that. So Molly, I, too. I really like the questions you have up on the screen right now. Um, I think the values questions are so oftentimes so vanilla that like you're not getting into the meat of something that's <laughs> going to drive somebody if your challenge is to like get people in the right mindset i think values questions might be really helpful like almost like a meditation at the beginning like mm -hmm. we all like open space we all want yeah. to use it in some way that's great but i don't think having a deep discussion about that is going to foster the kind of like problem solving mindset that i think is really helpful here because I think really if we just said we're going to conserve all land, all species are going to be preserved, we're all going to do whatever kind of recreation we want whenever we want and no one else will be there to bug us, everyone would be like, all right, that's not a problem. We'll just sign me up. Yeah, it's, our, we, it's a one page plan. I just signed it. We're done. And that's just not the way it's going to be. And I think what you have up here is really great because these are really open-ended, positive questions that engage with the values that you're talking about. But at the same time, they engage with problems that we have. And I think this is a good first step before you start saying, all right, now we can't solve them all, which do we do? Um, but that might be another, you know, another discussion for another day. But, but this is like, I think you're a great opportunity to engage people. It's a, a combination of values and uh, issues. I appreciate your point there, Kevin, because I think, you know, my experience of that is, you're right, you know, the vanilla thing, but it, in, it's funny and serious at the same time because it's, it's it describing importance, which is almost like a, um, getting a set of ethics that we all agree to. But what you're seeing is, and what Tom seems to be seeing is, with that, can you add, just with importance, can you talk about some possible directions to go in with that importance? And these questions are framing that direction. So if we can go away and come back with importance and direction as a way to sort of set up the conversation, mm -hmm. that by combining them, I, I think would get to that hybrid that you're asking for. But that's what I'm hearing also, and I wanted to confirm that. I know, Molly, that we've, we've been talking a lot. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to at least nod your head that that feels like a hybrid approach might work. I mean, is there anything else you might want to add? Well, you know, I'm kind of calling a lot of what people are saying together. I like the concept that we would have an example of something like the illustration point of view is a good, would be a good approach, maybe. Um, you know, I'm kind of coming back and forth on this. I feel like on the option one, it, it is, you go from point A to point B much quicker, but you also invite the fact that people might see us as it's predetermined what we've already thought and we're going, which speaks to Kevin's fears, you know. Um, so I guess I don't have any brilliant um, conclusions except that hearing everybody uh, talk about this, I think if the approach that we're looking for is to try to solve kind of the string theory of we're trying to figure out where we drop the first breadcrumb, if I'm seeing this whole thing. Um, it just feels to me like um, everything that we're talking about right now, we want as a deliverable. We want an example for the public to have the conversation. We want a good illustration so that the public is clear about what we're doing. Because I think the master plan is very abstract for most people. I mean, you know, you bring this up with 90% of the universe and ask them to, you know, come down and be a part of the master plan. They're like, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it's happy hour, no thanks. But, um, you know, so I don't know. I, I don't, I'm, Hearing what everybody's saying, we're talking about a similar thing, and what you're trying to do is get it in 
a format where we can at least start. Um, and it, it feels like we're kind of on three or four separate places. To well, let me, me. let me ask this, and, and I don't know, um, Kevin, if this will anticipate, if I, if I miss something, let me know. What I'm hearing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, everybody, is that I think there's a desire to find a hybrid approach to this. And if we do that, we also have to make it abundantly clear to ourselves and to any anyone that you as board members are having a conversation with and we as staff are having a conversation with, that we make it abundantly clear that that doesn't mean anything's predetermined, that it's just a way of starting the conversation. Okay. I have an idea. Um, I'm just wondering, like, I'm hearing this conversation and I'm wondering if you could almost take these topics and maybe take the verb out of it, um, which implies moving in a certain direction, and just mm -hmm. use the topics and say, like, for example, culture of stewardship and enjoyment for current and future generations. And a threat to this would be, and a, and a way to protect, enhance this would be. So you're, you're building in the question around a topic, and you're trying to get you know, you're trying to get to the master plan goals, so you're you're taking out the verb, which is implying we've already decided what this should go, and you're but you're allowing for people to put the verb back into the question. So that might be I was kind of thinking that might be a hybrid approach to what we're I like hearing. that a lot better because yeah. the thing I really struggled with with these questions is there was an implied value mm -hmm. behind each yeah. of them. Well, yeah, so people can put that verb in how yeah, they want, the and that would be do. the goal of that that question as yeah. we come out of the gates. And it just, I, I do think if you look at just the categories, those those have been heard over and over in this community, and there's probably little disagreement on them as categories, and maybe there's one or two other categories that we also don't know about that could be added in at the bottom. So it's not like these are fixed either, but they would be that framework to start. Well, I, building on what you're saying, like I was going to say, out of all the things that are up here, most of these are sort of inevitabilities outside of our control. Um, but one of them is not, and I think your solution solves that, which is the shifting resources from management uh, of and management from acquisitions to stewardship. That's a value judgment that really is like a, we're going to change directions, we're arbitrarily choosing that. Something like climate change is kind of like, well, we either address it or we don't. and. I, I, I frankly don't consider that to be one of those like, well, maybe the community's not for that. Um, how we do that might be a big question. So I think by removing the verb out of all of this, you do, you know, just say like, you know, what do we do about resources uh, with acquisitions and stewardship? And then they can say, buy more stuff or build more trails or whatever they're going to say. Or shift resources. Right. You know, that might be a way to protect it or a way or a threat, you know, and people might identify those as that threat or enhancement in the beginning. What, okay. what it sounds to me where we're perhaps heading here, which I kinda like, is um, from my perspective would be a sort of Delphi process where we're framing questions <laughs> and then we're looking for a series of answers and that allows us to reframe the question. So and it, it's also getting to the point that it's not predetermining the process if we're clear about that because you need a better set of questions to get to a better set of answers. And we're, we're going with staff, we're going with the board, we're going with the public, and we keep reframing those questions and then refining the answers. And that ultimately leads to some pretty good strategies at some point. Um, that if, we're, if we think about it that way and explain it that way, it might be a way to get that sense of this isn't predetermined, it's a starting point, but it's, not a, it's definitely not a finishing point. Mark, what about the idea also, since you were talking about how you know, people who aren't getting into meetings, uh, you might not know how or why they're not. Maybe find a way to ask the questions and see if you're missing major questions that some people in the community want. I'd not recommend doing that in the middle of a public meeting, but, but the idea of like maybe there's a big question OSMP and OSBT is just totally brain dead on and, and, and they, they will say, oh, what about this? I like that, Kevin. I, um, in our partnership with the Youth Opportunities Advisory Board, we've toyed with whether we could go to them, for example, and say, okay, here's how we've decided to frame the community process. Can you help us tweak that so that it's in teenager speak? You know, uh, how else would we ask that question, or what else would we ask in a way that would make this useful for you to have conversations with your peers and tell us what they think? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's 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 an interesting suggestion. I, I think, thank you for this. This is very helpful. Um, it, it really is, and I think that the details of how we do 
this obviously have, you know, we, we need to work through, um, but I think that we do, again, just let me make sure I understand, I think we have consensus that we want to find a hybrid approach to this. Um, and, and again, just be clear to, to ourselves and the public that that doesn't mean it's predetermined. Now, my, so is that, just sorry, one more head nod that we feel comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. Um, or smile, that counts, smiling, thank you. <laughs> um, my last question about this is just that, is this additional context that you needed to feel comfortable with the project management plan, or are there additional changes to that that you would need to see in order to recommend this? I had one more change to the project management plan that, that maybe I'm just being a little overly concerned. There's a couple places where there's language where, like, um, what guides OSMP, the city charter, the charter, a, the plan will take a balanced approach to achieving all open space purposes. Um, sounds like to achieve all open space purposes, balanced. Um, while all open space purposes may, may need to be honored because they are part of the, char the charter, uh, this process may come out that the community wants us to work more actively in one direction or another direction for, for some period of time or something. And I don't want to preclude that it's like we have to do balance all seven purposes at the same time. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. But I, I want to leave the door open to prioritization. Yeah, that, that's there, some, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, just, there could be a greater threat to one purpose. Yeah, than the other. And yeah. So you're saying you just need to put more resources there so that you're maintaining accomplishment at the same level. What were we, you thinking? We've run into that exact thing. And, yeah. and so what we've often used is the word integrated, you know, instead of balanced, because we found that that, okay. that tends to, to work. I like what you said, too, about honoring all of them. But yeah. in, from a kind of... Uh, practical point of view, what we sometimes have to do is, you know, do our best job at integrating rather than, than balancing because there isn't really a threat to the scenic backdrop or yeah, there isn't yeah. really a, an action we take that <laughs> it comes along with the acquisition of the property, for example. So. Okay, thank you. Couple more minutes on process and then I want to switch to the report. Yeah, you asked if there were parts that we need more information on. I think an area we really haven't talked much about is the future trends and focus areas. It almost sounded like there might be a, a second or an addendum <coughs> to the system overview. Um, and maybe that's still in flux. I mean, maybe if we go in a particular approach here, then the trend information gets rolled out sooner in a discussion of threats or something. I don't know, but that still seems to me in flux. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So this this needs to get reworded with with this hybrid approach. You know, we've got the the key over here that describes them. So there will be a nuance, a, a change in this diagram, absolutely, in the next version of the project management plan to reflect what we just discussed. Um, you're absolutely right. The other question I, I had about this, if, if I could just entertain you just for another couple minutes on this, is just if there are any key moments that, or any key ways that the board wants to be involved in this process. I've alluded, for example, to this idea of at the point of confirming our focus areas, we would do a study session with the board and council. Are there any other major milestones like that that you feel like we might need to plan for something like that, um, especially as we think of the rest of 2018? I would see similar at the end of each process, because you're going to have to close out each process. And so is it something that's going to take a study session to do? Seems like it might. Just OSBT? Well, I, you've got to decide if you're going to get a council thumbs up or thumbs down. Mm -hmm. you're going to do that at each stage. Okay. And that's something we can certainly tease out in more detail with the process committee, but I just wanted to get if there are any major desires from the full board at this point. I'd love to hear them. Nothing else. Or any other ways that you might like to be engaged? I mean, you know, <coughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think just in general, I'm probably not going to be able to attend every single public meeting. And I think it would be helpful for whatever information you're gathering, if there's anything that has some sort of sense to it that like we can have 
first, uh, like, here's the data. Just here's what everybody wrote on their thing. You can read it if you want, you fool who has too much time on a Thursday night. Then second thing would be like a good sort of whatever, here's a summary that we'd get out of, you know, out of these public meetings, this is what we heard. Um, something like that, I think, at every uh, to be available to us, not necessarily presented to us, but mm -hmm. like just so we, we have the option of digging as deep as we want. I'm not asking you to generate more data than you were going to anyways, but if you generate it, if there's a way that we can access all of it um, and a summary, it would be helpful. Okay. And that would be useful for everybody? Yeah. Okay. All right, terrific. So we already are going long. I do want to talk about the overview report at least briefly. Are you guys willing to just? <laughs> Forgot about that. Just the overview <laughs> report. <laughs> Our idea is we really just wanted to get you familiar with what you'll see, with, with, with what you and the public will see in, in February when we release it. So it's just a preview. Um, and so let us do that. Does anybody want to stand up? Do you need to like do a little stretch of some kind? I'll just, I'll Please do. Okay. <laughs> Are we taking a little break? Is that what we're doing? I was doing it just a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> just okay. Don't go too far. I'm ready. I can toss them over here. All right. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Make it a break for it. Okay. All right. So I am going to keep talking, right? Because we still have all of our board members. Yes. Okay. So purpose of the report, again, an opportunity to inform and educate our community as it relates to who we are, who our, our, our purposes are, the state of the resources, and the state of the operations as it relates to those OSMP purposes. And also, the purpose is to support the development of the focus areas and strategies in the master plan. So deliverables, we, there will be a big report. Just warning you. It's about 150 pages of text before being laid out. That's about 10 chapters, but that includes snapshots. Uh, we, we will include snapshots, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, as well as maps and diagrams to make this as visually accessible as possible. There will also be an executive summary, and we'll pull from those snapshots and put a short amount of text at the very beginning of those to give you a digestible version. We'll also have posters and handouts available at meetings and online. And, <clears throat> excuse me, again, online we will use all available formats. We're not sure what that'll mean. And we're looking at ways we, we can use, we're not, we're exploring this, but ways we can use the idea of a story map online to bring some of this uh, information to life. Here's an example of one of those snapshots. So for example, because we said we are starting from a place of celebrating our 50 year uh, anniversary of the sales tax, why not also start the report with a description of our legacy to date, our timeline essentially of OSMP history. So here's a nice visual way to kind of look at the major dates and, and, and um, milestones through our history. Another example. This comes from a chapter that we're, we're putting together on water and floodplain management, um, pulling from charter purposes, obviously. So looking at an easy way to get into that information and to see that we've done some analysis to see uh, the percentages of perennial creeks and ephemeral creeks in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Planning Area that we have protected. Uh, looking at the same thing as it relates to the percentage of floodplains, for example, that we've protected in the BVC BVCP planning area. So, um, say that five times fast. Um, so again, trying to find every opportunity we can to present and summarize the information for each chapter. Are you going to try to do that for each charter purpose, a snapshot? For each of the major content areas in the plan, yes. Yep. Uh-huh. And you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. So. Here's another example um, as it relates to uh, passive recreation. So we'll have lots of graphs and pictures and uh, ways to describe the information. So not wanting to dwell too long on these. These are very much in draft form, so please know that. Um, but again, I uh, just wanted to give you a sense of a flavor of what you'll see. 
So what I'm going to do is just very briefly walk through a general outline of the chapters in the plan. Um, the One of the first, after we talk about the, our open space history, our legacy, is to go into the purposes, plans, and policies that create our foundation, our sideboards, so to speak. The next is to talk about sort of how we do our work, our operations, and so that includes acquisitions, it includes finances and funding. Uh, part of that includes economic conditions as it relates to those things. Um, again, how we do our work, how do we deliver on the charter, what does that mean in terms of our operations, the role of the board and partnerships, uh, also our role in safety and emergency management, and that's uh, a large part of um, our, our ranger services. As it relates to our natural heritage, we'll be looking at things like biodiversity, the important species that we protect and provide for, our overall forest and grassland health, stewardship efforts as it relates to these, uh, to these resources. Water and floodplains, you got a little peek in the snapshot, but um, the watersheds that, we're, that we interact with, uh, um, the riparian areas and wetlands, describing those and the related resources, lakes and ponds, floodplains, there'll be a little highlight on the 2013 flood, for example, but so that we also understand the role that we play in reducing floodplain risk for our community. Um, the relationship between water and, bi water and biodiversity and water and agriculture, so making some connections across chapters as well. Agriculture, we know a lot about having just done a, an agricultural resources management plan, and so you'll recognize a lot of the information in this chapter, I will tell you. Um, <laughs> you you've seen it and, and read it before. As it relates to passive recreation, we'll talk about the various activities that are available to experience, the ways that we can experience open space, and what that means in terms of visitor use and experience. I wanted to highlight again that the, there will be a separate report that comes out in about Q2 of next year, about May-ish, um, that is a, a report out on the system-wide survey that was done 2016 to 2017. So that data will not be included in this overview report, but when it's available, it will inform the uh, development of our focus areas and strategies. So that will be brought to bear in the conversation. And you'll be summarizing previous survey. <laughs> what we know, absolutely, what we know to date will absolutely be in here, you bet. Um, trails and visitor amenities are described in here, also in terms of how we manage the, those assets as a system, um, and what we do to provide for recreation. So again, sort of that state of the resource also, and state of the management operations as it relates to recreation. How do we connect the public to nature? So we connect them uh, with the land through a number of uh, education, outreach, and volunteer opportunities. Same with recreation skill building, volunteering and service learning, youth and families, inclusive opportunities. So really talking again, again about the services and programs that we provide within um, this particular area. And then the last chapter, I know I'm going super fast, but the last chapter is this idea of cultural and scenic heritage, which is a charter purpose um, that we, you know, we've heard in our resident survey that our community is very interested in. So what does that mean in terms of our, the land use and area histories that we know about, the cultural landscapes and, and uh, designations on our system, the various landscape features and landscape types that define how we experience those uh, scenic landscapes, um, and, and what scenic values are um, demonstrated in, in our system. I just went through that very quickly. Molly, yeah. Let me ask just one kind of generic question. Where is the conservancy going to fit in the ending of this? And where does that get mentioned or, you know, where's the merger? Um. As they are technically not approved as our official partner, they right. don't currently exist, but we can talk about, you know, it's like a suggestion in how we, uh, financial side, et cetera, partnerships is where we can begin to describe that potential. Because at some point you're gonna see an MOU and have to approve it. Right. So that's we why. Have it allow we have an allowance. Right. Okay. But that just didn't see. Where so that's a good question, yeah. yeah. Under partnerships. Right, okay. yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, this is a fabulous report, I can tell already. Yeah, I know. Uh, I sometimes feel like we should have started this conversation 
here and then might have um, avoided a lot of other yammering that we did at you. But uh, do you think that if someone read this, they would perceive, thank you, would perceive um, areas of concern? For example, let's take trails. Uh, is there something in here that says, well, 60% of our trails are below standard or something like that? Or are those sorts of challenges not going to really be apparent to people reading this? I'm, I'm trying to figure out, of course, how far this helps us get along the way towards understanding threats and opportunities. Right. So where condition is, where we know condition, we have made our best attempt to represent condition. Um, and, you know, in the way um, that we've presented our snapshots, so let me go back to those just to show you, for example, you know, we're not necessarily, again, because we're trying to manage the conversation in a, and sort of move it into a positive realm, we're not starting out by saying here are all the problems with respect to, you know, but here's the general state of, of um, our water resources, yeah. you know, so I, I don't know if that answers your question. I think um, we have actually talked about it's like an honesty exercise, here's how we're doing as stewards as best we can, and here's where we need help, and here's where we feel confident. Um, we think, you know, that's, you know, getting to emerging trends, opportunities, that's when we'll deal in with that more. This is really saying here's sort of an honesty exercise of where we're at currently. Well, I, I think this is proper in that you said it earlier. If 98% of the people are really happy with their experience on open space and, and for the most part we've got stable health, you, you want to capture that here. I mean, you don't want to start out by saying, woe is me. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out then that transition. So, thanks. I, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, on the, I would have had a more substantial separate call out of the sort of acquisition slash what I might call sort of system vision. It's called out under operations, but I think that was more on the how we do acquisitions, uh, the nuts and bolts of that, um, and not the, the issue of, you know, kind of where are we, where are we headed, what are our priorities, um, and issues like, um, you know, the role of acquisitions and on sprawl issues, and um, I think that's a that's a distinct topic. Um, that's an important component of a master plan about, you know, with whatever dollars we have uh, available for acquisitions, how do we want to spend them, and what are our priorities, and in, uh, integrating that to some extent with the acquisition plan. But to me, that's a separately called out issue. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tom, and I might not have characterized it um, as well as I could have. Let me... Okay, because I, I thought yeah. you were talking about more at an operations level as opposed to you a... No, this is where... <laughs> no, no, yeah, you're, you're getting it, to, you're getting it. inside our brains. I mean, because we, we've toyed with, should it be its own chapter? What should we call it? What da, da, da. Um, but I, the, to clarify, what is in this chapter is a description of the nature and level of acquisitions to date and what we know of just a general estimate of acreage in remaining acquisitions based on the analysis done in the previous update to the acquisitions plan. So we do have that information in here, for example. So I think that starts to get to what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was going to get all Rumsfeld and be like, <laughs> I think there's a question that might be worth, <laughs> might be <laughs> worth explicitly stating um, the, the known knowns, the known unknowns, and oh, the no. unknown unknowns. <laughs> so essentially, I think there's a, we have a, a strong research bias right now where we have very little understanding of recreation, um, of explored recreation here and abroad, uh, how it might be applied to here. We also have a very strong bias towards species that are currently ranked as endangered or listed by the state with a much lesser understanding of the ecosystem and unlisted species. I think explicitly stating that might give people a sense of like, okay, when you talk about this, you know what you're talking about thoroughly. And then this other thing you say, well, we're planning on, or we want, we're thinking about studying this in the future. What do you think? Um, so anyway, I think that might be a good thing to put someplace in here. Go ahead, Carrie. You know, that, that gets to one of your slides in the earlier presentation in the project management plan where it talks about available data. Some things we may not have yet. And I think that that addresses it in the system overview where we've also, we know it's coming 
in the project management plan, but it might be an opportunity in the system overview to address that as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great lens to take in our final revisions of it. You know, I'm thinking of some examples where we absolutely have done that. You know, we, we're learning, for example, about historic trails. That's a new way of asking and learning about our system. And so we, we're putting what we know in there, and then we're saying we're also continuing to explore and understand this. So, I mean, part of it, I think, is it might also drive a lot of questions about <laughs> the known unknowns that you don't know but someone else knows, or, or that, that they don't know and nobody knows, but somebody wants to know and you didn't want to know it before. So, <laughs> so like, so, so, so like Wait, historic yeah. trails is a, is a new thing that someone thought about. And, and you might not know the next new thing to think about. And if you ask people, they might say, have you ever considered whatever where the, there was a secret alien landing site. I don't know what it is, but that's why it's unknown. I guess the point being is that like the public may have more ideas about the things that should be researched that that you and I haven't thought of yet. Anyway. Oops. I'm going to try and answer and it sounds like you might want to add to it but uh, Kevin you're absolutely right you know we've never having not done a master plan before we have similarly not also put together a full-scale report like this before and so this is our best attempt and our hope is that again in the spirit of efficiency through this process that we treat this as our first version and that when we get back to our next master plan update or it, at a more frequent interval if we need it but that it's at, at a later time that we come back and update the report as we learn those things and I think those questions will also emerge as we've just discussed in the way we frame the policy questions you know and so some of that um, we might realize in that first engagement that there are some questions, oh, we do have information on that, so we can bring that to bear, absolutely. But if there's a place where we don't know, then that becomes a consideration for turning that into a strategy in the master plan to close that data gap. It, it seems to me that <clears throat> you set the stage with this, and then the question is, well, where's the, to use the term, where's the SWOT analysis going to come from, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats? And I think that's that second report. I think that's, you, you've got a standalone document that tries to stay the current status of things, but it doesn't really try to pull out what are the threats we need to engage for the future. Mm -hmm. And that has to happen next. And how we roll that out, how much we ask the public to brainstorm with us about threats or opportunities, I don't know. But I mean, that seems to me sort of a second stage. Any other, yeah, thank you. Any other questions, reactions? Can we rename the report to Open Space 101? <laughs> I mean, like, I feel like I could have used huh? this yeah. and read it before uh -huh. I started serving on this board and uh -huh. would have, like, walked into the room a better board member. We all <laughs> Kind of interesting because we do have a, a staff training program called Open Space 101 that's part of our orientation for onboarding folks, and yeah. so it's... Uh, it's a it's an idea that's out there, and so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you guys like that? <laughs> the concept is there, though. I think that's certainly what we've been trying to do. Is again that in that inform educate mentality that. There's a lot to learn. I mean, we as staff have learned a lot through this process ourselves. If Open Space 101's taken, how about like Open Space for Dummies? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just add that I think that that's going to, like, you could tear out any sheet in this and take it to a classroom. You could take it, you know, you could engage with somebody around, you know, those first time people to the Open Space discussion in this master plan. They may not you know, asking about ecology, well, here, you know, you can go back to that and have a discussion. So I see it as just a tool that can be used. I mean, it's really exciting to have that as a framework, so. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, that's great. Do we need to blow these or? Oh, um, whoops. There we go. <laughs> All right, you guys, it's late. What I want to do is just confirm a couple of things and remind ourselves kind of where we've been tonight and make sure we're all in agreement. So 
the, the basic purpose of tonight was to build a shared understanding of what this process is going to look like. And so obviously we talked about some refinements tonight. And so we'll make, we'll make some adjustments to the project management plan um, and, and that will be in your next packet that comes to you for the December meeting. Um, and in addition, there will be obviously some more detailed conversations that we'll need to work out probably with the process committee um, as we move this forward. Um, one of the purposes also, if you remember in the memo, was to make sure that the approach to data gaps that you felt comfortable with. And so we've talked about that in a number of ways, that again, if we don't have all the information, it's an honesty exercise, we'll say we don't know it, and then figure out whether that needs to be a strategy in the master plan to close that gap. So I wanna make sure that we all feel comfortable with that. Again, because we want, in, in the spirit of efficiency and moving through the process in an effective way, we need to, be comfortable with that so that we don't get to a point where we say, wait, we can't make a decision until we have more data. Yep. So we're all comfortable with that. Okay. Okay. Terrific. Um, the other thing is that we wanted to give you the opportunity to make refinements to the process. And so I think we've done that. So thank you, especially for this particular aspect of that. And to also hear from you how you wanted to be involved in the process. And so um, I, I feel very grateful for having gotten the feedback from you all on this. And I wanna ask you if you feel like based on those, the general intentions for tonight, whether those have been met for you also. Are there any lingering questions or concerns? Silence, a good sign, I think. Andrea, no? One thing in the yeah. process was um, planning board. I would like to see planning board plugged in at some point earlier in the process rather than they, oh, sorry. I've been great about the microphone all yeah. night and I forgot, like, right now. Um, I was looking back at my notes and, and before tonight's discussion, I was like, why do we have to go to planning board after we approve it? Like, why is there a planning board between us and council? And you told me why. But... Uh, it, it brings about that they, I feel like they need to be at least informed earlier in the process rather than dropping a plan on them after we've gone through everything. And, and just so you know, we've, we've been talking already with the planning staff uh -huh. so that we're building that connection. In fact, the process committee was a, a big consultation with the experience of the comp plan updates. So, um, and we'll be dealing with uh, initially Typically the way this goes is initially we'll deal with the planning staff and, and advancing, you know, is there an interest among planning board to hear some of this sooner? We can certainly convey that there's an interest among the board to, to do that and, you know, depending on their schedule and their level of interest, you know, we can try to advance that so it it doesn't hit them cold. So, and there, in the, when we did the uh, visitor master plan, we actually had a joint open space uh, board, planning board session, a study session prior to the planning board um, adoption or recommendation to council for that master plan. So there's a lot of options when we get closer down the line. Definitely, I just want my process colleagues to be aware that, you know, let's try and keep all the gatekeepers in sync as we go along. That's great, that's great, terrific. Well, thank you, I know it's been a late, late night. A question that Mike Burrell was thinking about, he may not know it, but I think he is, and it's sort of a general thing for the public to reassure them. He was saying, hey, we're starting to see all this neat trail maintenance going on because we're past the flood. And, and then he's looking at this process and he's thinking, all maintenance is going to stop for 18 months while everybody gets sucked into the master planning <laughs> maelstrom. Are we ready to make a general statement to the public that even though this is a huge activity, you see where I'm going with this thing? I'll let Tracy answer that, but I, I yes, I'll let Tracy answer that. Yes, trail maintenance will continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's a lot. I mean, and, and you talked about getting information from everybody in the org. I mean, it's a big demand on people's time. We're also trying to streamline that and, you know, do that at key milestones, too. So um, Mark is good at saying, don't let a good plan stand in the way of good work. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You bet, you bet. Let me just reiterate next steps, and then we are almost out of here. Okay, so... As I've said, we'll make some changes to the project management plan and submit that to you for next month. We're hoping that in December you're confident with those and that you can recommend that council move to um, accept those. We then will, in as Tracy mentioned, do have a similar discussion to tonight with the board, excuse me, with council on January 4th. It'll be a little abbreviated. It won't, we won't have quite as much time with them. Um, 
in hopes that they then support the process officially on January 16th. If that all goes well, then we will aim to kick the process off, the public process off again in the latter half of February. Um, and really starting in January, we'll have a rhythm absolutely every month with the board where we are either giving you an update in the form of a, an update from Kurt and Tom from the process committee or a staff update. And so you can expect from one or the other that starting next year, we'll have a, a regular approach um, to engaging with the board moving forward from there. Um, those are the major ma next steps. Um, what last questions or thoughts do you have before we get to really blow our horns and get out of here? When, when exactly do we get to see the full report? For the overview? Yeah. At the, at the kickoff. So we'll... The kickoff. Uh-huh. Yep. So we're looking at, again, the latter, the latter half of February. Oh, you mean the board. Our hope is that we can just release it all together to the okay. public. Yeah. Because if you give yeah. us a draft, it's public at that point. I yeah, mean, exactly. There's really no way yeah. for us to do a review. Oh, yeah. Sure. And we're... It's too bad. Yeah. Again, we're hoping that we're not sort of doing draft one versus final draft. Yeah. Yeah. Here's our... Good. That's, That's a good thing. That's a good so, thing. When yeah. Building on that exact thing, one thing that everyone was really challenged by with North TSA was, it's the meeting day, here's the report. Do it like a week in advance so that people can read it, think about it, especially at 150 pages. Then they show up at the public meeting with something to say other than like, I have no idea what's in here, but let's have a discussion. So it might be good to just have that like one week leeway kind of like we get every time for our packets yeah yeah i appreciate that okay excellent thank you for going a long time tonight especially two nights in a row for those of you who were out with us last <laughs> night so you are officially released okay <laughs> let's blow the horns one last time <laughs> yeah <laughs> molly was a great